Hello and welcome back to Beyond Boards, a podcast dedicated to the actions and interests of skaters beyond skateboarding. My guest today, Josh Stewart, is one of the best skateboarding filmmakers out there. He is known first and foremost for his cult classic static videos, which have become the golden standard of independent skate video projects worldwide, starting with Static 1 in the year 2000, up until Static 6, which came out recently in the later part of 2023. In 2007, Josh founded Theories of Atlantis, a skateboarding distribution company based in New York City, which distributes unique skater-owned brands such as Magenta, Hops, Isle, Evison, or Traffic, to name a few. I had the opportunity to sit down with Josh for a Zoom call to surprise him with some questions from longtime friends of his as he was visiting his family in Florida in January 2024. So here's my conversation with Josh. I hope you'll enjoy it. Born in the late 70s in Tampa, in Florida. Your older brother Jeb, who was sponsored back in the day, got you into skating. I read he was sponsored by 8th Street for a while. And so you started around 11 or 12 years old, so in the late 80s. And so you started filming pretty quickly after that, like within a year or something, you already were filming. In the following years, so the skate park of Tampa opened in 93. So you were hanging out there a lot. You were uh, shooting a lot of contests over there, Tampa Pro, Tampa Am and stuff. You connected with a bunch of local local skaters from Florida, like Paul Zitzer, Mike Frazier, John Montesi, and started filming all these guys as there weren't probably a lot of filmers accessible. And you started sending in footage to 411 at the time. You also filmed some of uh, Mike Frazier's part in a visual sound, which I know uh, was uh, a very influential video for you, one of many. And then in 95, you told in other interviews that you drove to San Diego as a sort of a pilgrimage to kind of go see like the epicenter of skating at the time it still to a degree is but uh then you started doing well in the middle of all this as you were skating and filming you started making your your own local videos the first ones were very florida based of course the very first one you made was called prospects then you did cigar city in 96 and then you did another one called rising for a local shop called world market i believe and then eventually you got to the static videos and the first one was in 2000 and uh yeah in the middle of all this you connected i don't remember how but you met with uh jamie thomas he had a part in your video cigar city he like uh, hired you as a filmer to film some of the toy machine team as they were filming like a tour for uh to promote welcome to hell at the time and so as you were starting the static videos so you, you did the first one and the following year as you were trying to sell the video you went to the asr trade show trying to find like a distribution for the video basically and you connected with um jeff taylor who was the tm at adio at the time i'm going very quickly again but he kind of offered you to make the their video one step beyond which came out in 2001 so that was like i guess your biggest brand project aside from all the videos you, like your your more indie videos that are really your trademark or like that you're really not well known for and since then so throughout the 2000s until today you've done five more volumes of the static series the second one came out in 04 the third one in 07 the fourth and fifth one which the fifth one was a surprise it, it was uh, not kind of uh, supposed to happen but you made two videos instead of just one in 2014 and the sixth one just came out a few months ago over the summer in the middle of all this, also, I should mention that, you, of course, you started your distribution company, Theories of Atlantis, which you've talked about in other interviews, and we'll probably talk about it at some point as well during our conversation. But uh, you started distributing brands that weren't very present or not present at all yet on the American market, especially like Magenta, which started in 2010. And their boards were made in the States, so it made sense that you would distribute them in the States. And then a bunch of other brands kind of got on board. You started distributing Polar and Palace, all this new wave of brands that really popped off in the early 2010s. And yeah, and so Theories of Atlantis is still running today. And as I said, your latest project, Static 6, just came out uh, and was amazing. I really enjoyed it and we're going to talk about it. Thanks. But uh, yeah, that's a very, very brief summary of your life. I mean, there's a million other things we could say, but uh, I'm sure we'll cover some other stuff in the middle of our talk. Yeah. Yeah, did I say anything uh, wrong in there? <laughs> no, no, it's pretty on pretty on point. I mean, I think it's a I appreciate like the mentioning the skate park at Tampa, the Jamie Thomas thing. Those are kind of things that, that um, were significant in you know kind of like helping me get to another 
another level or whatever you want to not another level but they were important connections that helped yeah steer. pivotal moments yeah yeah, yeah mm-hmm. for sure and it's funny because you're mentioning the neil mims episode that you did a long time oh, ago yeah. but he was when i went to california i didn't know what i was doing and then we I ended up living in neil mims's house for like six months or something like that oh but, really yeah oh wow, yeah. cool Ah, if I had known, I would have reached out to him. And oh yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> too bad. <laughs> <laughs> I think you got enough, probably. Yeah, I have enough Sounds questions. Like as it is. <laughs> That's true. All right, so yeah, let's get into these friends' questions. So the first one is not really a question; it's more like a, a shout out. It's from Colin Reed. Mm-hmm. So he said, my question is, actually, it's not a question but a statement. Quit filming already, you psycho! Save yourself. <laughs> <laughs> that was just to get us started. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He finally, you know, he moved on to doing uh, non-skate work, you know, and he and I both, he's had some really bad uh, lower back problems and stuff related to filming like I have. So he and I, whenever we communicate, it's typically about that. He's yeah, always yeah. just telling me like, dude, what are you doing? Stop. Like, why, why are you doing <laughs> so, this to yourself? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Then the next one is from Brian Schaefer. Oh, wow. So he said, uh, ask Josh about his older brother riding for Life Skateboards, a Ron Allen-owned skateboard company. Jeb, Josh's older brother, was a great skater and most likely had some influence to getting him into skating. That's rad. Um, yeah, it, it's funny because I went to, uh, when I was a kid, you know, I've, like you said, I've mentioned some stuff in past interviews, but um, even before I skated... I didn't want to skate, you know, because it was what my brother did. And yeah. in the eighties, it was skateboarding was huge, you know? Mm. And I just thought I was like, I wanted to do something that wasn't cool and was, you know, like yeah. whatever. So I avoided it for a long time, but, um, I would, you know, on Saturday mornings, I'd be watching cartoons or whatever. And my brother would roll in the house with like, you know, his whole squad was like, it's strange because Florida had an incredible scene of, of talent, you know, so you had like a lot of guys that at the time, you know, people, you know, under 40 might not know any of these names, but like Bo Turner would be at our house or, you know, John Montesi and Mike Dare and like, oh, yeah. so it, I was always surrounded kind of by like that, you know, and so my yeah. brother would leave to go skate and then I would like go and sneak in his room, you know, as, as a little brother does and read his magazines and look at his sticker collection, you know, so I was, I really, I liked skateboarding culture and especially the videos you know he left his videos sitting around so i would watch his videos and uh specifically i remember i'm pretty sure it was band this is like the opening scene of band this where stacy peralta actually made the music for it okay and just the way i was like i didn't care about skate you know i didn't know tricks or anything and i didn't care about what somebody was doing but i it the way it was edited was just like i was interested in it because of that so i think that kind of got me interested early on but when I was 15 I flew to San Francisco to stay with my brother and he was riding for life okay and um Ron Allen had an apartment in uh Berkeley or Oakland I think Berkeley and um my brother lived there and then Keith Huffnagle lived upstairs in the uh, like one of the rooms upstairs and John Reeves was down the street and so I was kind of like you know, that's 92. So that's right after questionable. I think questionable was 91. I can't remember. I think so yeah. I mean, that video was like, you know, like nobody can ever understand if they weren't a, a skater at that point, how mm. unbelievably it was. It was like looking, it was like dialing up into the future 20 years. You know what I mean? <laughs> it was that I had never seen anybody do a nose slide on a ledge in person by the, when I saw questionable. Okay. So going to San Francisco, we went to Embarcadero and like, you know, I was terrified, oh, yeah, <laughs> I was I'm terrified sure. yeah. to even step on my board. But anyways, my, I'm bringing that up because Brian Schaefer, him and all his, his friends from Florida did a road trip out to California and they were in San Francisco at the same time. And that was my first okay. time meeting him. And there had been these, I think the fires were a result of the earthquake. So there was a huge earthquake. This is a really long answer. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> it's just no, making it reminded me of stuff. I think the that massive San Francisco earthquake that happened, I think it was 89. Yes, yes. I think it caused a bunch of fires up in the Berkeley Hills, like where these mansions were. 
So all of those hills were just completely leveled, but there was a bunch of pools left over. So I remember skating a pool or watching, you know, like mm. pumping around a little bit, but watching Schaefer and those guys. Schaefer was a, a gnarly vert skater. Mm. Um, and so him and Jeb and uh, my brother and, and those guys, watching them skate that pool and stuff and then, you know, learning about who Brian was, you know, and then, then he came, you know, a couple year later, he ended up coming out here and or coming out here, returning and starting yeah. the skate park at Tampa. Right. But, right. um, but yeah, just all those experiences, you know, like, like I said, I was 15 and we were, we were, I got to film Keith Huffnagel skating Hubba hideout, you know, and wow. like skated with like Shermil Randall. And then we went to this like indoor skate park, like a private park. And it was like Carl Watson and like Ben Sanchez and these guys that I had been, you know, that I soon would see, they weren't even known outside yet, uh, yeah. you know, but seeing them in like the chocolate videos and the, and all that stuff soon after. So it was like, Having my brother, I, my brother never took me skating. I was never like, it was only that trip that I skated with him oh, ever. Okay, okay. It was, it's weird, yeah. He kind of had like a weird, I don't know why, but he had kind of like a falling out with skating while he was out there. So when he returned to Florida, I think he was 18. When he returned to Florida, he kind of quit skating for a while. So okay. so anyways, my point is I, I got like, I never really properly went skating with him except for those experiences in San Francisco. And it's just a... I had this like cheat code kind of, you know, where I was like, because some people knew my brother or had experience, you know, like I would go to skate park at Tampa pro contests and like, you know, Ron Allen would be there and I'd get, you know, like I knew him from San Francisco, yeah, you know, yeah, and I'd yeah. like, or people like Jim Thebo or somebody would kind of like, you know, they knew we didn't know each other, but I would get a, a little extra pass, you know, because yes. like, and like Bryce Knights, I saw Bryce Knights at some event, like way later, let's say like 2000. Mm -hmm. And I had never met, and he was super, you know, just like Josh, you know, and it was like super cool to me. And I was like, holy shit, I forgot. Like, we went to his where I think he had that ramp in San Francisco, like Studio 40. No, what was it? It doesn't matter. But mm -hmm. just all these little things, you know, where they, it was thanks to my, you know, my yeah, brother. Yeah, yeah. I kind of got extra, some, you know, in some instances, I, I already had a little bit of an in in yeah, that yeah. sense. Of Looks people, like you, you got know? your foot in the door kind of uh yeah in the very early stages yeah it helped you know in, in his scene you know his because yeah. a lot of the stuff you know anything else i did like as a filmer i wasn't working with people who really knew him because they were like my generation you know mm. but anyways does he skate at all these days your brother it's funny he he's one of these people who's just naturally good at anything you okay. know and so he won't skate and then he'll get back into it and he expects himself to be as good as he was. Yeah. So he all, it's insane how every single time he'll skate, he'll have a good day, first day out skating. So then the next, next time he goes out, he tries to skate like it's 1990 again. <laughs> <laughs> and he, and he gets, he, every single time he breaks, he broke like his collarbone oh, and then he stopped and then he went, he started again and he fell and broke his teeth out and then he stopped and then he started skating in the last time. I mean, there's, there's seriously an endless, there was like, it was already established <laughs> that every time he skates, he gets, he gets hurt. Yeah. He went to the skate park at Tampa and he hadn't skated in like a year. He dropped in and ollied the pyramid and in the air, his truck fell off. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, shit. That's when he broke his collarbone. Oh, wow. But the last time he tried to skate, he literally broke his back. He fractured his back. Oh, damn. But it, it wasn't like, it, it wasn't bad enough that it like, you know, caused uh, long lasting problems. Like he was able to heal from it. Okay. <laughs> he oh, fucking yeah. broke Thank his God. back, dude. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's like you wish he wouldn't get back into skating. I know, <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah. I know. Yeah, yeah. I gave him a board for Christmas this year too, so like hope, yeah. put it on the wall or <laughs> don't yeah, skate. We'll see what happens. All right, so let's do a first audio question here. Hey Josh, what is the explanation behind the word static for your videos? And uh, what is the best things and the most complex things to shoot with uh, a 16 millimeters camera? Thanks. I can't, I'm trying to place the, the voice, but I... So the, the accent is French, that will help you. Yeah, I figured, I figured that <laughs> out. <laughs> it's not soy. I have a question from soy, spoiler alert, but uh, no, that was uh, Julien Januskiewicz oh, okay. from the Bordeaux okay, Exposure cool. videos. I was going to guess that at first, but uh, I don't know if I've ever spoken to him, actually. Okay, yeah, I, I just did an interview with him. Uh, it's the next one that's coming out. Oh, cool. In a, in a week from now. Yeah, it was nice. Uh, nice. 
I mean, the, the static one, I've honestly, when I, early days of doing static videos, I would always write like, you know, I'm, I'm super embarrassed when I look back at things I've written on the back of like box covers and stuff or like, you know, and I've, I made up explanations of why the word static was like what it meant, you know, and is like so, so ridiculous. But <laughs> realistically, Paul Zitzer and I were skating a lot together in the late 90s. And I, I specifically remember, which is crazy because my memory is terrible, but I, we were coming back from a road trip filming in Miami, mm -hmm. driving back to Tampa. And um, we were just talking about making this static video, you know, because I wanted to do a part with him, but we wanted to, we're obviously influenced by Eastern Exposure 3, you know, so mm -hmm. we wanted to involve skaters from different scenes, not just Florida, you know, yep. and... And we were just talking about what could it be named. And I just, it's honestly, I think that it was the idea for the name static was more the visual that it brought to my mind, you know? Mm -hmm. And I can't mm -hmm. say if it was him or him or I who came up with the name. I just know we were driving back and that name came up and I just liked the, um, the potential visuals, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, sure. you know, it's before, you know, there, there was obviously in the, as HD took over and became the norm, and then everybody tried to make their stuff as clean as possible, mm -hmm. then 10 years into that, the natural progression of, you know, everybody kind of follows trends in, in every, you know, industry or like artistic movement. Sure. And so everybody started trying to make their stuff to give it like film leader, you know, like there's HD videos that have film leader used as the transitions, which makes no sense to me whatsoever. But, mm -hmm. you know, so things started pushing back to that, like trying to make stuff look, you know, like analog and have like tape glitches and, and stuff. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. That was kind of like a vibe that I was, the name static brought to my mind in when we were talking about it back in, you know, 99 or whatever that was. So that was kind of the, I was like, oh, that'd be a, an easy way to kind of give the video a look and a feel, you know? Yeah, so it was yeah, more yeah. based around that, you know? And it's funny because the word static technically means like, you know, stagnant and not moving and, sta yeah. you know, stationary. Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. kind of like the antithesis of like a skate video where you're like, and then uh, the 16, I kind of don't understand this 16 millimeter question, but I kind of, I guess he's just saying the difficulties, but the, and the pluses. Yeah, kind of, I guess the ups so. And yeah. Downs. yeah, yeah, It's weird because I have like this like sentimental and like looking from the outside, I, I have like an ego surrounding the 16 millimeter thing because I was stupid enough to kind of like stick with it for a really long time and where for a while I was one of the very few people still shooting 16 where I was copying Ty Evans. I mean, I, th mm. I think. You know, if I'm looking back, I'm like, what probably influenced me to go s to buy a 16 millimeter camera? I, I would imagine it's got to be Ty's Transworld videos, which yeah. were just like, he created like so many incredible moments with mm. his editing and 16 and stuff. So, so I probably got involved in it because of that. And then it kind of just became, like I said, a, very few people kept using it. I think some people were influenced by Ty. They did, some people did it. And then it was just so expensive. And then HD soon became kind of the norm, you know, like right. by like 2000, I don't know, seven or eight, probably started becoming the norm. Yeah. So I was like one of few people doing it. So it kind of became like a signature for me, you know, yeah, it was like a sure. go-to, mm -hmm. you know, like a, any, I hate to, I'm not calling myself an artist, but like what, you know, how certain artists decide to, you know, they stick with one medium and, and it yeah, becomes yeah. kind of their look. Sure. So it kind of be, like, for me, it just became like an essential tool f specifically for static, but, you know, depending on, a, and it just, the film just has a, a texture, you know, and a, yeah. A dynamic range too, where that video still can't match, and the, there's so many happy accidents too, like you know, with film where you can you can really experiment a lot, which was like I'll I'll have a lot of accidents with you know where I I don't want to say accidents, but things I'll mess around with while I'm shooting, and then mm -hmm. after when I finally get the film back, I'm like, oh shit, that would be really like uh, there's one of those for Static Six where um, I shot something in Chicago mm -hmm. for a theories trip where I was doing something with uh, creating like streaking lights, like I won't bore you with the details, but basically that idea is what created, I was like, oh shit, okay, that, I wanna try to do that with the titles for static. Cause okay. I always want static titles to be, you know, something unique that I haven't done before. Yeah, yeah. And so it's just like kind of an a, a experiment slash accident that turns into, you know, like an art direction for something in the future. And so 16 has always been like an awesome, like source of that for me where I get to like screw around and then, 
you know, I'll see something in it, you know, where it's because it's film. So you'll get some like weird anomalies that you wouldn't get with video that that are surprising. And like I said, happy accidents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other side of it, too, is like, especially now, there's very few things where you have to delay delay your satisfaction, you know, or delay mm. where you have to, you know, and wait that, to see the on, end results or, yeah. Yeah. And film is one of the last things where you still have that experience of like, I would typically, I would shoot for like six months before I send my film in and then I'd get it back. And then when I start going through it, I forget 80% of what yeah, I shot. Well, yeah, so every sure, yeah, you know, yeah. stuff pops up and it's like either a big disappointment, which yeah. is very often, <laughs> very frequent for me. Sure. And then those things that are like, you know, just it's it's such a, an exciting and rewarding yeah, experience yeah, yeah. of making yourself wait. Mm. And then the, the negatives, you know, are like, obviously, it's the, the, the Bolex is, was built, I, I think, I, I'm making this up maybe, but I thought the Bolex was built for like war photography because it's very compact um, okay. for a film camera, especially in the 50s and 60s. But it's, it's really dense and super strong and, and uh, durable, but it's heavy, you know, for yeah. something so small, it's really heavy. And to film in a city like New York, where you don't use, a, I've you know, never used a car to film there. I'm always on on foot yeah that with a vx with the batteries and the lenses and the film is it's just it's a lot it's and, a lot and of so weights carry around yeah for sure yeah so that's that's a big negative and then also you know like a good example is that cairo that that trip in in uh oh, yeah. cairo egypt yeah, yeah you know where i'm shooting stuff and then that you're never ever going to be able to reshoot you know mm -hmm. and just praying to god that you you know you meter the light right you know that you your film doesn't have your camera doesn't have a light leak and you know all these kinds of things and and i i had i've had a lot of experiences like that where i get back and then the, like that in the egypt that there's specific crucial shots that were ruined because of a light leak that i wasn't uh, aware of you okay know? So, you know, it's like, that's part of it, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah, you have yeah. these big pitfalls, and then you have big wins, you know, so yeah. it's, it makes it a little more fun. And it feels more, you know, just like in in a world where everything's more and more, you know, now, especially with AI, everything is so like, artificial, you know, and and, and doesn't have texture. And, and like, you know, it doesn't feel like it has blood, sweat and tears in it anymore. And so film, yeah. especially 16, it's one of those things where or not 16, but motion picture film, it's yeah. one of those things where it still feels like, you know, you're injecting some of your own artistry into it you know what i mean all right so this next one is from uh, aaron mesa so wow he said who are the greatest floridian skaters from the following decades 80s 90s 2000s 2010s <laughs> and who's taking it today <laughs> oh my you god have five dude. hours <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's no way I'm going to be able to answer yeah. most of that, but yeah. uh, <laughs> Jesus. I mean, I've said this a lot of times and I've never pursued it, but I always said I was going to do an article on Theories of Atlantis about how California gave birth to skateboarding, but Florida... I don't know. I had a, a term for it, but like Florida basically is where it, it made it interesting, became an adult <laughs> um, or whatever, you know, where, it, where it matured because it, it's like the history of Florida. It, it, it's it, Florida is like, you know, if po obviously now politically, it's like, it's like such a, you know, a, the butt of every joke. Um, <laughs> uh, and it's in skateboarding, it's been kind of like, It's frustrating because people on the East Coast, like in New York, D.C., Philadelphia, Boston, they don't consider Florida East Coast. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then also, you know, California for forever was the center of everything. And so Florida was, you know, we were kind of like, I felt really ignored. And that was... Mm. That was a lot of what kind of fueled my, you know, Does passion. Like film, yeah. Yeah, is being ignored kind of made us feel like, hey, fuck that, we got to make a name for ourselves, you yeah, know, whatever. Yeah, sure, sure. But, you know, if it wasn't for Florida, you wouldn't have Rodney Mullen, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> who invented yeah. every single foot <laughs> trick every one of yeah. us are doing. Yeah, sure. You wouldn't have Alan Gelfand, who technically first person to do an, an ollie. Yeah, yeah. And you wouldn't have Paul Schmidt, who basically, you know, created the modern skateboard or kind of like helped bring the technology into, you know, the boards we skate today. So yeah. I think Paul's from uh, from Tampa, actually, which is incredible. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so those are some, it's some pretty key characters. And then for yeah. me, I, just to try to keep it brief, I think 
you know, the eighties, it's hard for me to, I wasn't really like presence, you know, as a skater in the eighties, you know, I know yeah. there's like the guys I just mentioned, you know, and like Monty Nolder and like I'm trying to think of guys from that generation. I'm, I'm far from an expert. So I, it's, a, it's yeah, I can't help you there. Not, not, I'm not somebody <laughs> to, yeah, but moving into the nineties, I mean, it's incredible, you know, uh, Mike Dare. Yep. I, I think Mike Dare's style, his style alone, it was, it's, I think it's one of the, an early example where somebody's style alone had a, such a major impact when his part came out in, in a, the stereo video of visual sound. Mm -hmm. So incredible. And then, you know, I mean, the 90s, Mike Frazier, his vert skating is just like, you know, and again, he's one of those people who doesn't get the credit he deserves, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, his vert skating was so incredible. And so any, I think if you ask any vert skater in the world that, you know, is over 30, let's say, and you ask them their top three favorites, I feel like he's going to be one of the most consistent yeah. in there because of his... Um, so, and I had, you know, me having the benefit of growing up skating in the skate park of Tampa, seeing Mike, Mike was constantly there skating vert, you know, like I got to film with him a bunch too. And I mean, there's, you know, Scott Conklin and Lance Conklin, those guys were again, significant in helping bring credibility to the Florida skate scene in the nineties, early nineties. And then early two thousands, I mean, these guys were late 90s, but kind of became more known in the in the 2000s. Jeff Lenosi and oh, yeah. uh, Ed Salego. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, for me, you know, they were in my scene. And then, you know, you had like Alyssa Steamer, so many strong characters. I would, I would place them late 90s, realistically. Yeah, Reynolds. And then, yeah, and then Reynolds, of course. I mean, the list of Florida skaters is, uh, it's unbelievable yeah, yeah. if you really break it down. Because there's so many technically, you know, like Chris Markovich is technically from Florida. Oh, yeah? Okay. And, uh, you know, Clyde Singleton. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I should be more prepared for this, but the, the yeah. list is, I mean, yeah, of course, Reynolds. It's like, how can you deny the influence of him? But just uh, overall, like, man, I'm spacing. But obviously, you know, Steve Brandy's one of my oh, yeah, yeah. my best friends and, and one of my favorite, you know, styles from, I would put him in the early 2000s as well. And then, you know, the past 10 years, definitely it's it's kind of like a different, um, like, culture or whatever you want to say, it, you know, face of skateboarding. But, you know, Jamie Foy and, and Zion and oh, these, yeah. you know, guys are, like, on a whole nother level. Yeah. I mean, you can't, again, like, Jamie, you cannot, it doesn't matter what your taste is, you can't deny yeah, it. Yeah, the talent. How incredible. Yeah, His, yeah it's, a, it's, a, it's amazing. And, and I remember seeing him at a, I had to film a Tampa Am contest one year. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just like before people knew him, you know, and, and whoever was announcing was kind of picking fun at him because he was wearing like a pink shirt and he was kind of like a little chubby. And he was fucking, he was just so ripping. And it was, it's, it was rad to see somebody who's like, who doesn't fit the mold, essentially. You know, he didn't fit what was like cool for like a, and, and he just commanded people's attention regardless, you know, like. Sick. But anyway, sorry, I, I trying to. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's great. That's short. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but it's, yeah, I mean, again, we get, I mean, there's so much talent coming out of Florida. It's uh, hard to uh, mention everybody. And, yeah, uh, I mean, I'm, yeah. I think it has something to do with weather, you know, like the weather, like there's a lot of talent from Texas as well, Florida yeah. and California, because we just had, they're big states that had decent weather all year round. So I'm sure that had a lot to do with it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I could list so many people. Sorry, I, I keep thinking of different, like, <laughs> yeah. Dave Duran. Like, his style was so fucking sick. And, like, obviously Matt Milligan and, like, and then all these guys that didn't get well-known, like Chris Williams. He was, like, a local Florida, uh, Tampa, Clearwater guy. And, I mean, it just, it's endless, man. There's so many. <laughs> Billy Rohan. All right, so the next one is from uh, Roger Bagley. Oh, wow. Whom you worked with on uh, the One Step Beyond video. Yeah. And so he asked, back in the day, Josh would only write Scott Johnston boards. Maybe <laughs> ask him how theories, brand shapes are modeled after that board. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was interesting. Like, did he mean uh, Scott's chocolate boards or before yeah. that? I'm trying to remember the, what was he writing for before chocolate? Uh, Jeez, was it Mad Circle before chocolate? I don't I know. I think so, yeah. I think Think was the first one, then Mad Circle, and I guess then chocolate. Yeah, I think, I think that's it. That's crazy because Mad Circle was so long ago. It's crazy that if that was his next sponsor. I, I mean, it was more like I would find a shape I liked and just ride that same thing over and over and over. So it, before that, it was the Donnie Barley Smoker graphic. I wore, rode that toy machine board forever. And mm. then uh, somehow I ended up on the Scott Johnson board and just like, you know, nowadays kids 
everybody loves to switch their shapes up all the time yeah. and try different. I'm like, dude, what the, f-? like if, if something works, I am not going to change it. <laughs> yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. I do not want anything to change. Yeah. And that Scott Johnson board, like for years, that's all I was writing. I think a lot of it is just the, you know, you pick up a board, there's like a feel mm-hmm. to like, I'm sure the edges, the way the edges are sanded have something to do with it. And then the, how light it is. And the, that board felt light and crispy. Okay. And when Magenta started doing their first run of boards, they started using generator wood. And when I felt their board, I was like, it felt that same, felt like that Scott Johnston board. You oh, know, nice. it had this like light crispiness to it. And the shape wasn't super steep, but it wasn't flat, you know, so it was like right in between. Mm-hmm. Um, so I kind of transitioned into skating magenta boards. But I wonder what I was writing in between that. But I don't know if I went from the Scott Johnston <laughs> boards to magenta boards, but that got me onto anything generator, you know, which is kind of like every, like theories boards are all, we use the same shapes as magenta because I just, love that yeah that works the best yeah but a lot of people you know it's like people who grew up on the northeast they skated chapman boards because it was all zoo york all their boards were chapman wood and it's very it's the exact opposite it's really it was like a dense like very uh stiff. heavier yeah very heavy and some people like um you know they love that because that's what they grew up yeah, on yeah, in exactly. the northeast yeah. which makes sense you know and then i have one from jeremy ray wow <laughs> he has two two uh, funny questions. So the first one is ask him how white lightning is doing. <laughs> that that was his beat up car he was driving while filming for the audio video. That's insane. He <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you, did you do an episode with him? No, 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 no? not yet. Okay, he's I'd done like a few. Though, he's done yeah. quite a few. It's dude. His I don't know why, but his um his storytelling is really enjoyable to me. Like yeah. he's a, he's a he's a fun person to listen to, and he's done a lot. So for sure. And he's an again. He's one of those dudes who I feel like people now are trying to push his story, but he didn't get the proper like legend status, you know, yeah. that he deserved. Like holy crap, dude! Yeah, what he like. The way people skate, you know, that, that's what's so frustrating is, no, you know, like as a fan, you know, you, you can't ever impress upon people how integral these characters were to how we skate today. But yeah. Jeremy pushed the limits on things, but in such a like tasteful way. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like he did it in a way that was like, I don't know. Anyways, um, <laughs> The White Lightning was like a funny, it was just a, it was this Isuzu Rodeo. It was the first car I bought like by myself. Mm -hmm. And we did like a slap article about it because the amount of miles, I drove across country in it 10 times. Oh, wow. Florida to California and back. And uh, that's a lot of miles. (laughs) Yeah. And every, so everybody ended up in that thing, you know, so everybody had like an experience and it would like, you know, had moments where it was like, it went from co- being called white lightning to white frightening because it would be like breaking down <laughs> or like where it was going to like <laughs> flip off the side of the highway. But, um, it's, uh, I can't remember what I did. Oh, it, it do you know what ended up <laughs> happening to it? I was, I knew it was about to die. So I was driving to a dealership to look at, um, one of these early, um, hybrids. It was like a, a Ford escape hybrid. And I, as I was driving to the dealership, right before I pulled in my white lightning overheated and just steam started blowing out of the hood and i pulled into the dealership with my car like basically almost on fire (laughs) and so it was just like they saw me walk in they're like oh my god we got this dude (laughs) and uh and i ended up donating it i got like a thousand dollar tax credit to donate it for free because it just wouldn't drive anymore but wow but yeah it's cool because everybody there's like a little club of people who all have spent you know months driving across country in that thing Okay, the next question is from Patrick Wallner. So cool. he said, I remember sitting in front of you at the Static 3 premiere in NYC back in 2007 or 2008 Jeez. in a failed theater. There were some technical glitches happening and I remember you quietly cursing away into the universe. <laughs> Luckily, it all worked out at the end and it was one of the most mesmerizing premieres I've been to in the US. Yeah. What is your take on premieres? Do you enjoy them or are you like everyone else worried about the reception of the film and technical difficulties yeah wow that yeah that was a cool that was a really that was probably one of the best premieres because it it was it was super fucking stressful and uh it was the most filled i think that theater sat like 450 people and then we every step in the theater was filled with people sitting on the stairs people standing it was like 
and the air conditioner couldn't handle it because there was so many people. So everybody was sweating bullets and um, it was just, it was awesome. But uh, the experience of, it's weird because that nervous feeling and, and like anxiety ridden lead up to the, you know, pressing play as miserable as it is, it's one of those things that now I like this last video, you know, we premiered, we did 50 premieres around the world and I, I didn't, I went 50. to like 20 wow. of them. Yeah. 50 total. It's insane. And I went to about 20 of them, but they, uh, that crazy anxiety has like kind of worn off. Like I don't, I'm, I wasn't feeling it as much, which sucks. Cause that's like. The rush you're looking for, kind of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I felt it at certain, like the LA premiere. I told people at the premiere, I was like, this is crazy. I was like, I, I haven't been nervous at any premiere, but I was really nervous at the LA one. And the New York one, you know, was the lead up to it was the same. But um, mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's weird because I haven't been as, I was more prepared this time around too, because now theaters require, a lot of theaters require this special uh, file format called a DCP. Okay just a dis digital cinema package basically if you have your if you if your file is set up as a dcp and you show up at a, at a theater it's like 95 percent chance it's just gonna work you know okay. it's like that's why they do it because most people you show up with like a dvd and a, a random QuickTime file and it doesn't their system can't you know read it or can't handle it so this time around i was using the dcp for most of the premieres and it was w working well mm -hmm. except for the la one they couldn't figure it out but so that wasn't you know that nervous that because it is it's it's insane no matter how prepared i've ever been for any every theater there's always something wrong there's always <laughs> a cable there's a special cable that's missing or their their machine won't read your file and but that New York one specifically, a part of the reason it was so full is we partnered with Chapman because they they did a, a full length video and we split the cost of the theater. So they premiered their film and then ours came up. So they were local. So they brought in a lot of a crowd too. Okay. But his their video was a different format and it the switch over from his video to mine, they couldn't get mine to play. So oh, I was, I was fucking losing it, man. But <laughs> yeah, it, I'm sure. It finally worked. And he asked also to follow up, traveling to what country with Kenny Reed gives you the fondest memories? Oh, man. You were mentioning the Egypt uh, trip. Uh, that must have been uh, quite nice. Yeah, that one was funny because he, he got, Kenny got, um, he got beat up in Barcelona the night before we went to Egypt. So he was oh, wow. like kind of bummed and he had, he had sunglasses on the whole time because he had two black eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so, wow. so the whole trip he was kind of bummed and like had, you know, but uh, I think the, for me, the best experience was probably our trip to um, Belfast, Ireland. Cause he, we went to London. Our first, the first static two trip was, I, I really, I really wanted to film in London. Yep. And uh, he was like, oh, London, it's so, you know. Not exotic too, enough for me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And so he kept pushing. He wanted to go to Belfast and the, the local London skaters were like, mate, you don't want to go to Belfast, mate. You know, like, <laughs> don't fuck that. Yeah. And then he just bought tickets for us. And then so the next day we met up and he's like, hey, we're going, we're, we fly out this afternoon or tonight, you know. Oh, I'm wow. like, what? <laughs> you know, like, yeah, so he just made it happen. And we stayed with this guy named Bernie Ray. He was like a Irish skater and, and they had this tiny crew that was all like super rad. But it was like, I think Kenny had, had become pretty well known at that point from the, um, maybe from Seven Year Glitch, I think had come out before that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just like Kenny Reed comes, you know, and stays at your house in this tiny, there was like five skaters in all of like Belfast. Yeah. And, you know, Belfast has like a, you know, gnarly history with the whole political... Right. And religious, you know, thing. And, and so, you know, we went around shooting those murals, these, these sketchy like IRA murals. And the locals were like really not, you know, they're like, dude, I don't, you know, if you guys are going to do this, you have to do it at like 7 a.m. Because if people oh, see yeah. you shooting, yeah. you know, so... But it was just, that was my first trip with Kenny and uh, he was stoked and it was, I don't know, that's just probably, probably my fondest. And then, you know, staying with him in Barcelona, that wasn't really like traveling for him, but mm -hmm. we spent a lot of time there too with him and uh, he lived with Paul Shire and Kenny Hughes. Um, oh, okay. So it was a cool, cool group of guys that we were rolling around with. All right. Uh, I have a few questions from Jeff Taylor. 
Wow. Let's see. Maybe, maybe <laughs> let's, let's just do one. So how about I just read you what he sent me? You can pick the question you want to answer. Okay. So the first one is, if Static was focused on West Coast skaters, who would have been in the first video? So that's question one. Then, was there anyone you ever really wanted to do a part with, but they wouldn't do it? Mm. Then he asked also, who was the most frustrating person to work with? <laughs> Not necessarily <laughs> in a bad way. Maybe someone whose potential you could see wasn't materializing or maybe just had a string of bad luck. And his uh, last question is, where is the glass box you use to keep Kenny Anderson <laughs> safe at now? <laughs> that's funny. So yeah, if you want to pick Jeez. one or two or something, yeah, whatever. Uh, yeah, that's a tough one. <laughs> I feel like, I mean, his question about, you know, the potential, seeing the potential, I think uh, for Jeff and I, Jeff was the brand manager, I guess you would say, team manager of audio. Yep. So that's why I got to know. And again, he's another another one of those guys. He's just a, a great person to have in charge because he's positive and awesome and just like, you know, nobody could say, I don't feel like anybody could say anything bad about Jeff. Mm. But uh, he and I, I think maybe a good one to address would be uh, Nate Broussard wrote for audio. Yep, yep. And um, when we started work editing the video, he had almost nothing. And it was like, he wasn't super motivated. It just, it seemed like he wasn't super motivated, but yep. everybody he saw this like incredible potential you know in his skating and then he quickly like within like a week and a half he filmed you know enough to have this little vignette in that video mm -hmm. and then um when i started working on static 2 i was living in philadelphia and roger bagley started basically working at audio mm -hmm. full time and he i think he came to philadelphia to work with bam for uh something you know maybe maybe for uh jackass or something yeah. but he he Labatt brought or... Nate Broussard with him mm -hmm. and he was telling, he you know called me or texted me and was like, yo, what about, I heard you're working on a new static too or something like our new static video. He's like, what about Nate having a part? And I was just like, dude, no offense. Like, yeah, he could maybe have a rad part, but he was just so, I need somebody who's like really motivated, you know? Oh yeah, yeah. And he got Nate out to skate with us one day in Philly mm -hmm. and Nate, I think filmed three things and each thing he did was incredible. And it was like, he had gone from being like, like a 16, 17 year old kid during the audio video to now being like 18, 19 and his style had also matured. Yeah. And it was just like all of us, like I think maybe Steiner, Pat Steiner and maybe Steve Brandy. I can't remember who was around at the time. You were but all we, impressed. Whoever we we're, I mean, everybody was like, dude, this dude is like, and I think if you go through the whole history of static, Nate's style is kind of, you know, one of the most blatantly like stands out as one of the most beautiful styles in the series, you know? So sure. yeah, yeah. I would just say that. And Jeff, those are all rad questions from Jeff, but I think that one makes sense because it kind of relates to both of us because Jeff and I, Jeff was the one really rooting because he's from Texas. And Nate, Nate's from, you know, Houston, uh, that area as well. So oh, okay. Jeff was really kind of trying to bring him on and, and make something happen for him. Mm -hmm. And at the time, it didn't look like Nate was really, run, you know, taking the ball and running with it. But then, thank God, they like Roger and Jeff pushed him to get yeah. involved in that static video because it, it really helped make that video. Sure. Yeah, definitely. You know. But you were saying that was when you were shooting Static 2 or were you uh, doing Static 3? Because he had a part in Static Sorry, 3. Sorry, you're right. You're right. Sorry, Static 3. Okay, I was just thinking okay. because I was because I did Static 2 right after the audio video. So no, yeah, totally. It's Static 3. All right, let's see. Then I have one from Andre Stringer. Wow, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. So from my understanding, he did the cover graphics and the design on uh, the first static video. And I think he also helped out with the animations on uh, One Step Beyond with right. uh, Jose Gomez. So he said, can Josh touch on some of his sauce for bringing new elements to the skateboard video format? How do you think beyond the bangers and make a video that is ownable as a filmmaker? Hmm. Jeez. I mean... Oh. Andre, it's hard because each one of these people, I want people to understand, you know, like I want to tell people all about them and sure. why, you know, they're yeah. so, but Andre just like, he was a filmer in Washington, D.C. When I started, I fell in love with the Washington, D.C. skate scene and just the look of D.C. and stuff mm -hmm. um, in like 98 uh, when I was working on another video. And Andre was a filmer, but he had like, he had so much promise to be doing something outside of, of skateboarding. Mm -hmm. And he, for some reason, welcomed me in and let 
let me stay at his house and he he helped me with like he impressed upon me the, I guess the the importance of creating kind of like an identity you know around a project and so mm-hmm. it was perfect timing because I was just starting the static video and he was like kind of just at that point I think really getting to know After Effects mm-hmm. but he just I was showing him some of my Super 8 footage and he just saw this weird little flash the camera moves past this reflection in the in uh, one of the reflecting pools in front of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington DC okay and he's like oh right there he's like right there that's what we need and he took that and he isolated those reflections and then he cre- he had created a static logo and he just I mean he did this so fast too and then he just composited that little flat like looped this flash and put it over and that look you know like Mm. it was so exactly like with the name like I said to you about like the name static and the texture that it brought to my mind he captured it visually so well yeah that's Um, awesome and it just it it just yeah it had a big uh, effect on on me and like I said trying to create an identity and, and moving on from that the I've said it a lot but how important the packaging, and I don't mean the physical packaging, I mean like the overall like branding of a video where yeah. if you have strong elements, they don't have to be super technical, you know, like super well done, but strong elements that give an identity, like a unique identity to a video. And I'm saying, using my hands to explain like where if it had from the beginning to the end, if you have something strong in the beginning, something strong in the, in the end and some stuff in the middle that gives it, it it's a unique identity. It makes a, even a, a video that might be weak in the skate side of things. It really, it'll help elevate it in people, the way people receive it. And, and mm. uh, just experience and working with him, I think really helped me see that. And I kind of think that's what he's alluding to in his question too, where it's like every video for me, it's tricky because for years, for years and years, every time I did a static video, I was positive it was my last one. <laughs> and I also yeah. felt like it had to be as, I had to show that I was like, basically it was like almost like you're thinking this could be considered my resume, like the peak of my resume to get work outside of skateboarding, oh, you know? Yeah. And okay. or, Cause it always seemed like, you know, I was like, I'm not making, I can't really make a living at this. You know, I love it, but I gotta, you know, so yeah. I was always trying to like, I never, I never wanted two static videos to look exactly alike, you know? So I was always trying to think of like a new way to bring in titles to be, and I'm not good. I'm terrible when it comes to picking fonts. And, and so it's always like working, either working with somebody who I feel like is talented and and can bring that, help bring that element to the table that I'm lacking Mm -hmm. or like the newest static video, I did everything in camera. Like, so I, all the titles are shot with my Bolex through like a little complicated process to give them their own unique feeling without having to rely on a, you know, a designer. Oh, interesting. Okay. But there's always been these care, you know, I've always like Andre was the first and there's these guys, Josh Bertrand and Dave Rao helped me with static two and static three. Okay. And they're just like critical in helping bring like the ideas to fruition and help do that. You know, like I said, just giving the videos like a, their own significant, you know, I hate to use the term branding, you know, but their own like signature that is as memorable or leaves a taste in people's mouth as much as the skating, you mm-hmm. know? And, 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 you know, cause like I said, it's like, that's where you can make videos and make them super simple. And that's, that's typically what's most well received. You know, skaters tend to like, just want to watch skating anyways and good music. Yeah. yeah. But as a person making videos, like if that's what you do, you know, it's like, that's, it's so much part of my identity that I want to leave my, a signature of my own, you know, basically take it from, instead of just documenting, make it into your own art. And that's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. where people can kind of like have, you know, it has an identity beyond just a bunch of skate footage. And um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And those are the skate, those are the filmmakers or, you know, video makers that I have always, you know, like celebrated looked up or, to or, or like looked up to. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah like yeah, a definitely. Mike Hill with Alien Workshop or Castrucci with Photosynthesis or yeah, totally. Everybody gives their, anyways, mm. uh, long answer, but <laughs> that's no, no, cool. That's great. Yeah. I mean, it's a complicated question. It's cool question. you got Andre on there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I have a couple questions from Steve Brandy. Nice. He said, this question is from myself and our good friend, Travis Sales. Travis helped film a lot of Static 2. Ask Josh from the both of us about the time he ruined it for everyone at <laughs> La Quinta on the East Coast. <laughs> I knew that was coming. You felt it coming? <laughs> oh, my God. 
So is, is that something you can share it's or just, you'd rather yeah, not? It's, or? Just, <laughs> it's, it's such a, a harm. Uh, uh, like most people have, like people have these like, you know, like something like that might for somebody else, it might be some dark, like, oh, we can't talk about that. But for me, I don't, I'm not like, <laughs> it's such a, a harmless, like innocent thing. Um, we were at a, we we're on a, at a La Quinta hotel on our, on a road trip. And, you know, they have the free breakfast downstairs. Okay. You know, if you get up early, you know, you can get like some eggs or whatever, but they had a, a waffle maker. <laughs> this is so stupid, but it's so <laughs> funny. But um, they have a waffle maker and you pour the waffle mix in it oh, yeah. and turn it, you know, flip it over. And I made one. And then when I opened it up, it wouldn't come out. It was all stuck inside the thing. And I was like scraping it out. It's like, fuck, dude. And then Travis sales was like, yo, it's like, look, and the sign says really big. It says uh, spray the oil. You know, there's like a, oh, a yeah. can of uh, yeah. spray oil. So I spray the pan with oil before. before like, you super put important. The thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I like I like dug it out of there and went and because there's a line of people waiting to use it and then the next guy said out loud to the piece like dude that guy ruined it for everyone because <laughs> the thing was completely <laughs> fucked and now like travis ever since static too like travis was the best he's like the best dude and so fun to like travel with and stuff but steve and i travis is in houston and we don't really like we haven't physically hung out with him you know since static too yeah, which yeah. is yeah, you know 20 years ago so um every year he'll like do like he'll send me like a birthday thing and he makes he'll make some kind of meme with like a waffle iron and like the, the <laughs> <laughs> waffle game, bro. oh my god sorry it's like probably not funny to anybody but us but man no no I, i'm enjoying it <laughs> <laughs> he asked also another decent question would be ask josh what's the most number of times he's reverse recorded a line either myself or someone else Dude. Too many? Oh, my God. <laughs> Steve gives me a hard time about my memory. Like, he has this insane memory where he literally, he'll literally remember, a, like, the words I said on a road trip in, like, 2001, you know? Oh, I remember really? we were at that wow. gas station, and you said this, and then I said that. And I'm like, what? We were we were on a road trip in 2000? You know, I, I don't even remember <laughs> being on the trip. Yeah. Um. So I don't remember specifically... I've done it to Steve a few times, but a lot of people, they call it something else, but I call it backwards filming where on the VX, you know, you press the button and it beeps once for meaning it's, it's recording. Yeah. And then you press it again and it beeps twice. Well, a lot of times I'll be filming somebody. It's, it's usually when I'm filming like multiple people at once, you mm -hmm. know, because it's like at a certain point I realize, oh fuck, I should just leave it recording. Cause when you press stop, And then you press start again, it takes it a second to like oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. actually start recording. So a lot of times you can fuck it up that way. Yeah. So I'll forget. Sometimes I'm filming three people and I forget that I left it recording. So then here comes Steve. He's about to like get to the spot and I press record, but it beeps twice because it was already recording. Oh, yeah, 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 For yeah. some reason, I have this insane luck where I only do that on the one try that somebody makes it. So very the, the few times it's happened... Let's say it happens once a year at the most. Mm -hmm. As the person's riding, I press the, bu the button and I hear it beep twice, which means it's turning off. I will know. I'll say, I know for sure he's going to make it this try and they'll fucking make it that try. It's this like this strange oh, proof wow. that we have influence over reality somehow. Like I'm able to control. <laughs> I, I can only influence reality in negative, in ways that don't benefit me. <laughs> yeah, But it's right. happened to Steve. Oh my God, dude. I wish, because there's a, a couple significant ones where I, I did it to Steve, where it was like something we were filming forever and then he fucking finally landed. <laughs> and you reverse recorded. Yeah. yeah. And I, okay. I did it to Ed Salego once too on a significant one where I was like scared because he's like, It was a, a big trick and I fucked it up, but man, yeah. that is so, so disappointing. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I'm sure, but uh, it's not like you did it on purpose or anything. Mm -mm. But, uh, uh, yes, the last thing he said, also on a static one trip, when we returned to the van from dinner and the doors were wide open when we walked up to the vehicle, there's a story to that one as well that should be pretty good. And I, I think yeah, you that mentioned that somewhere... Uh, Yeah, that's funny you, that you actually remember that. I, I just wrote a, it was just an Instagram post I did, for like maybe this summer. But that was Joel, my, we were passing through Oklahoma City mm -hmm. and uh, Joel got this crazy line. Like Joel, that's just, Joel is like, he's so amazing where he, you know, sometimes he looks like he, he's like trying something where he's like, oh, there's no way he can do this. And then he'll just do it out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And he did something super impressive. He, it's in his static part. He nollies down a set of stairs and then kickflip no slides a hubba. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. 
he did that kickflip nose slide out of fucking nowhere and so fast. And so we went to a spaghetti factory, which is like a weird chain. It's like where people take their kids, you know? Like, um, so <laughs> yeah. there's this, and we pulled up to it and it was, for some reason, it was just sur- that area of town where it's just junkies everywhere, like everywhere. And we're like, dude, is it safe to leave the van here? And it's like, yeah. fuck, oh, whatever. We're going to, you know, the restaurant's right there. We could, you know, come out and check on the van. And we we ate and we celebrated joel's line and ate our spaghetti (laughs) and then we walked outside and the van somebody had left the back trunk door of the van completely open like in all our camera bags and our everything was right there for an hour and then nothing was missing wow and so i mean the I, I think that people probably thought it was like a setup, you know, yeah, they just thought yeah. there was like cops hiding in the bushes or something. Cause <laughs> it's too easy. Yeah. This, this looks like a trap or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dude, but all my footage, all the footage from that, that static trip, that was the main trip from uh, Washington DC to uh, San Diego. So it was like all of Jake Rupp's, basically all of Jake Rupp's part. Yeah. He filmed his whole part on that trip. Okay. So can you imagine, dude, if yeah. that camera bag got that stolen? Been, Holy yeah. shit. All right, I have a couple questions from Paul Zitzer. So he said, have you outgrown your tendency of leaving your wallet or other valuables on top of your car and driving (laughs) off? (laughs) How much stuff did you lose doing that? Dude, um, he used to call me (laughs) so stupid. There was some stupid... uh, Oh, God. It was like a 1960s TV show or movie with like Jerry Lewis called The Absent Minded Professor or something like that. And he would call it. That was like one of his many nicknames for me. Okay. I don't know why. I mean, thank God that trend has I, I haven't been I haven't done stuff like that for like 15 years. But I had this like 10 years of like insane. It's not bad luck. It's just me being absent minded. But I think it will, a lot of it is like I'm I was a filmer, but I was also a photographer Mm, and I was typically the guy driving everybody, you know, as the filmer ends up being, you know, when I was in Florida and as a filmer, you know, you have to charge all your batteries at night. You have to make sure you have tapes. And then as a photographer, I always had to make sure I had film and I had, you know, double A batteries for all my flashes. And then I remember, you know, so it's like, there's so much I wanted to do. I haven't done it yet, but I want to, I want to do like an Instagram, like comparison post of like a skater getting ready for a trip versus a filmer getting ready for a trip. Yeah, that would you know, be cool, yeah. Just the amount of shit you have to be prepared for. So I, <laughs> yeah. I, really, I always like blamed it on that. It's like, dude, how much... I have to remember yeah, so many yeah. things. But there was a classic one, is, and Paul was involved in that, is I, my first apartment, I would pay my rent in cash. Mm-hmm. And so I went to the bank and I took out cash to pay my rent. And I had like a little date organizer. Like everybody used to carry these like... It was like a little planner that had like a calendar oh, and yeah. cards and stuff. So... I put the cash in that and I was with Paul and we were driving somewhere like to go film and halfway there I realized I left it on the roof of my <laughs> fucking car <laughs> and then we we picked up some friends and we went and we were on the highway in Tampa in the divider mm-hmm. like on foot with cars going like 75 miles an hour past us all looking for this thing in the grass you know hoping we could find it and we never found you it never, so yeah some, I mean yeah that's... no so some some random like you know guy on the side of the highway got just lucky open that thing <laughs> up and was like holy shit <laughs> he actually asked something about nicknames too he said do people ever still call you the captain and where did no. that nickname come from <laughs> <laughs> i think there's two oh well there's a blatant reason i used to wear this stupid uh army hat and uh i think that a lot of things i can point to like where my decision because i i typically i don't break out of my usual like habits you know like i wear i dress kind of the same every day and, mm-hmm. but then there'll be something that influences me and i'm pretty sure it was sean mullendor came to tampa to film for static and he mm-hmm. was wearing like one of these um like army navy surplus uh hats that's like you know like a it's almost like a tin can shaped black you know hat with a short bill so i started i probably caught co- i think that's where i copied it from and I was wearing those for years and so Paul started calling me captain because of this is so stupid but <laughs> the, 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 there's that that TV show the love boat from the 70s the guy's name is captain Stubing and so Stuart Stubing oh, yeah, I yeah, guess yeah. that okay. Paul Paul just like that's how he would close enough and then also <laughs> I think I was probably kind of bossy back then. Oh, okay. That, okay. I, I assumed maybe that was, yep. <laughs> that was part of it. Because I was like, I'm the guy driving. I'm the guy filming. I think I, think I was a little bossy. And uh, I always assumed maybe that was part, but maybe not. But, <laughs> 
I met Justin Strubing once and he heard somebody, I think he heard Zitzer or somebody call me that, Captain Stubing. And he was like, hold on, what? And he was like, that was his, people nicknamed him, which it made more sense. His name was Strubing, so I could see oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Strubing, Stubing. But yeah, thankfully I escaped that one after <laughs> I, uh, I moved out of Tampa and wasn't around Paul that stick. much anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he asked also, did you actually win the first Tampa M or not? <laughs> That's funny. I think a bunch of people have asked something about that first time for Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, people always bring that, like, because every year now, Skate Park of Tampa posts, you know, like previous winners. And so it's been coming up a lot lately. Basically, that first contest that I won, it was not like what Tampa M is now. You know what I mean? Sure, it was well, like, yeah, it yeah. wasn't. So it was more like um, people from like Florida and maybe Georgia and Louisiana. You know, it wasn't like a global contest yet. Yeah. So, so yeah, I get to like, it's not fair because Donnie Barley, like the first real Tampa Am where it was like gnarly, Donnie Barley won that one. And so he kind of like, you know, he deserves the <laughs> credit for the roofers, yeah. but I, I get, uh, you know, I'll take it. I'll, I'll, I'll Yeah, I'll, yeah. Embrace it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And his last question is, will you tell the story about showing Dan Wolf your first video? <laughs> <laughs> so are we talking about prospects or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, Paul, any video I made, Paul had a part in or was in, in it, you know, because he was just like my like favorite dude, you know, and he fucking ripped. He skated street as good as he skated vert. And mm -hmm. so um, I was working on a video and I just finished it. And Paul, I didn't know about Eastern Exposure, really, the first two. And he told me about Eastern Exposure 3. You know, Dan Wolf was working on this video and he was coming to Tampa to film with Paul and Frazier. Okay. And so I was driving to Paul's house because I just finished Prospects. Like I just finished the master copy and I drove over to his, to his house to show it to him. And then when I pulled in, he had just gotten to his house from the airport. He had just picked up Dan Wolf. Okay. And this was like, I was probably 17, maybe even younger. I don't know. But it, I was like, I'd never met like a, an estab, somebody who was like respected, you know, another filmer who was yep. like respected and knew what they were doing. And so I was like, Paul Gatt it up like you know how gnarly you know telling me about tim o'connor which at the time nobody and my understanding is nobody else really knew much about him he was like dude i saw tim o'connor's part like holy shit this video is going to be the best video ever mm. so i showed up and uh it was like a big moment it's like i got this video i wasn't like oh dan you have to watch this i you know but it was just like assumed that hey we're so i put the tape in paul's vhs paul sat down some snacks and stuff and Dan's right there and the second the intro the big you know that's the part I want people to see you know the intro where you spend all this time to give it it started and Dan said all right I'm gonna go make some calls and he just left oh my god what a bummer <laughs> yeah did you ever talk about that with him later No, no, no. I, I never really like Dan was always like he was back and forth in Tampa, you know, for events for the, the contests and stuff. But we never were like friends. But we were, you know, I would talk to him when I saw him because like, sure, sure. You know, obviously, I think Eastern Exposure 3 is one of the easily top five most important skate videos. Sure. And super influential to me, you know, so. But, you know, he, he's also, he's not like, um, I, I, you know, I don't know him super well, so maybe I'm, I misread him. But he's not somebody who's like, like super outgoing and going to like start a big conversation with you. You know what I mean? He okay. seems kind of reserved. And, you know, I'm a little intimidated because he's like, I got a lot of respect for him. So we never really like, I just remember him. My last conversation with him, I feel like, was Dan Sturt. I was, we were at the Tampa Pro Contest and it was the Vert Contest was about to start. Okay. And this guy was running across the course And he looked seriously, he looked like a Navy SEAL. You know, he looked like a like a guy who'd been like out to sea for like 40 years and just like he had this big pea coat and this beanie and he looked out of place and I made a joke, I think. Okay. Like not not publicly, but I think I just made a joke about like who's this guy? And, and yeah, yeah. this is my faint memory. Could be wrong, but and and Wolf was like, that's probably the most respected, like the best photographer of all time and most you know, he was basically just like putting like like you jackass, this guy, you should have more respect for this guy. You should know who the fuck that guy is. Oops. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Got awkward for a second. Yeah, it was. It wasn't really. But, you know, then I, you know, in hindsight, it's like, yeah, I feel like an idiot for not knowing, you know. Who yeah, was, yeah. But... Well, it happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So let's do this next audio one. You, Josh, hope you're doing well, mate. 
Hey, listen, I got an idea. What do you think of uh, going to India to film some 16 millimeter shots of me picking my bottom? <laughs> you up? <laughs> it's funny because he's basically asking a question without really asking. <laughs> That's all he has to say. <laughs> so that was Soy Panda. Yes. AKA Roy Sunday. I don't know if that World secret's famous. out or not, but yeah. He goes to India typically once a year to visit family. And um, we were working on Static 3 at the time, and he invited me to come along. And I was pretty adventurous at that point, like, because I had been doing, I'd done a lot of traveling for Static 2. Yep. But I didn't know what I was getting in, myself into with India. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And literally, I've said this story many times, but when we landed, I was sitting next to a guy the whole flight. I never talked to him. We landed. Oh, yes, he yes. just. Yeah, I he just turned to me story, and he yeah. said, uh, he's like, you ever been to India? And I was like, nope. And he's like, I bet you by the time you, on, on when you fly home, you're going to kiss this plane when you get yeah. to, <laughs> on the plane. Yeah. And I was like, okay. And uh, he wasn't wrong. It was challenging. It is literally the closest you can get to time travel, I feel like. It, it's mm. like going back in a lot of elements of it are go, like going back to, uh, you know. Ancient times. Yeah, at least to the Middle Ages, you know, a lot of, in a lot of, you know, there's obviously they have technology and sure, sure, blah, 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 but it's yeah. just the, the way of, of life there is so insanely different, you know, mm -hmm. than a Western existence, I guess you'd say. So it was really shocking. And uh, at first I was super thrown off by it. And then after a few days, you know, you see a lot of homelessness in New York, but there's literally like just on the highway there's people sleeping in the medians you know in between like highway lanes and there's like no way wow. the amount of like i don't know it's just crazy the amount of poverty you see you know yeah. um and there's still there's leprosy you see you know we oh, didn't yeah. see leprosy as much in delhi as we did in um mumbai but just some you know it's just really shocking it's just really yeah, crazy yeah, and yeah. i'm i used to be i'm not nearly as bad now but i used to be a real big germaphobe oh yeah, yeah you know i was vegan at the time so it was just like super shocking and then but it's absolutely beautiful you know that's the thing it's, it's a photographer's like dream come true you know yeah. it's just everything everything is a beautiful photo and just so interesting and i love i love things that have character and history you know i love old stuff you know stuff that's old and weathered and man it was just incredible but while we were there i was the first person to get food poisoning of course even though oh, i yeah. got i went to uh the hospital before i left i was in philadelphia at the time went to the hospital and got like all these shots and like oh yeah they told me you know what to do to keep from getting sick and then of course i was the first to get sick and it's the <laughs> it's the sickest i've ever been in my life i seriously felt like i was gonna die it was insane oh wow and so I lost a couple of days from that. And then uh, I finally got better. Those guys went to Mumbai while I was sick in Delhi. And then I had to go by myself and catch up to them in Mumbai, which was like terrifying for me. And I mm. got there and then we were there for, I think it was two weeks, maybe somewhere around there. It was a long time to be in India. And then there's like three skate spots in the entire country. And we, we <laughs> exploited them. But there's Dude, there's so many stories. It's so unbelievable. It's so unbelievable. And to be there with Soy, like, because Soy, he just has like the best sense of humor and yeah, he's yeah. you know half indian so he's got like this connect it's just so funny but uh there's some stories that were you know long stories i could tell you that were so amazing but are mm. so funny but it's just too long but basically the, like two days before we're gonna leave mm -hmm. i was like i ended up like i said i acclimated to it and i really appreciated being there uh -huh. but you know having to search for a bottle of water just to brush my teeth you know to try to not get sick again was like every little thing was like it's a little taxing so i was looking forward to going home and then yeah. somebody bought some fucking Domino's pizza two nights before we left. And I, it looked disgusting, but <laughs> finally I was like, fuck it. And I ate a slice. And then uh, like three hours later, I woke up with food poisoning again. Oh, damn. And it was like, you know, I, I just wanted to kill myself. Oh, and then yeah, I'm sure. everybody went out and nobody wanted to be around me. So they're like, hey, we're going to go <laughs> out and I'll walk around because I couldn't film. Yeah. And then I started hearing these explosions like far off at oh, first. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And I was like, what the? And, and then I, cooked up this in my head i was like oh my god like pakistan and, and india are finally going to war and i'm never going to be able to leave like mm -hmm. and as i'm panicking you know i was like delirious too because i was like really sick yeah, yeah this guy rushed this guy opened my door and come rushing in and he's like oh my god I'm, he's like i'm sorry i'm looking for my wife he's like they're attacking they're bombing or something i was like <laughs> what the fuck and he ran out of my room and i'm like <laughs> what's going on you know and i turned on the tv and the, it hadn't made the tv yet or news yet and then finally 
uh, or th- then there was a bomb. A bomb went off like three to four buildings down. Massive explosion. The whole hotel shook. Like wow. c- uh, cement came cr- falling from the, the ceiling, dust everywhere. And there was an Al Qaeda attack in Delhi. And right. they, yeah, they yeah, yeah. set off three bombs. And one of them was just like right down the street from our hotel. Killed 16 people right there. And Soy, or Soy and Ed and Ed Selega was there, Guru Kalsa. Oh, yeah. And they didn't come back for a long time. So then I started thinking, oh, my God. Yeah, what one happened? Of them. Like, yeah where, yeah, where are they? Yeah. So needless to say, uh, you know, I got on the airplane still with food poisoning and got on the ground and literally kissed the airplane. <laughs> kissed the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> Thank got you. Back on. <laughs> Wow, yeah, that must have been so intense. Every, yeah. So he's always making jokes about <laughs> about me going with him on his next trip. <laughs> yeah, I've never been to India, but it looks like a culture shock, to say the yeah. least. Yeah, it's so worth it, though. It's like one of those things, it's like, even if you have the rough time I had, it's, I'm still super glad I went, you know? It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, incredible. I'm sure it must be, yeah. Especially now, looking back, I'm sure it's great, but like, when you're living it, like you, <laughs> like you just mentioned, like, I'm sure it's not that fun. <laughs> yeah. When you're in the toilet over there and just wishing you you were back home and not sick and yes yeah, yes that's, that's tough <laughs> imagine flying back like oh, i went yeah, from no. <laughs> i went from delhi to milan to london to jfk oh to God. tampa and so having food poisoning i basically didn't i should didn't even need, need to pay for a, a seat i just sat on the toilet the whole way <laughs> basically <Wow. laughs> like, should have gotten a discount for that yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay the next question is from uh, brian de la torre Oh, wow. So he asked, did you pick Jake Rupp's song in Static One? Nice. And I assume you, you must have. I feel like you've probably selected most of the songs in your videos. Yeah, there's definitely some exceptions. Um, and I usually, when somebody picks a song, I usually fight them over it for a long time. And then I, you know, I, like I've capitulated and then been stoked I did. Yeah. But Jake's song, it's one of the things, like I recently, I, it hasn't come out, but I did a little thing. I think it's I can't remember who it was for. Maybe Quarter Snacks or something, but mm-hmm. picking favorite songs, you know, and, oh, and, yeah, yeah. and why. And that song is probably one of my favorites because, you know, that was pre-internet. You know, I think LimeWire, it wasn't pre-internet, but it was like, no, I don't Early think LimeWire, LimeWire wasn't around yet. 1998, 99, I don't think. So basically the only way I would find music is I would literally go to an independent record store in Tampa. Yeah. And I would just look at CDs and album covers and just choose stuff based on the album cover and be like i wonder if oh, this wow. is going to be you know this looks cool and oh, take so my chances the visuals it. more than the the actual music yeah oh, i mean i didn't I couldn't listen to it you couldn't yeah, listen yeah, yeah, to, yeah. you know open the so that one i was like that era there was like um a lot of like i guess you'd call it trip hop you know yeah. it was like sneaker pimps and like uh the matrix had come out fairly oh, recently yeah, yeah. you know it was like that kind of era yeah and I went to even what like crazier. It was uh, there's a, ch- a chain of bookstores here called Borders. Okay. And it's just a, a big giant, you know, like corporate bookstore, but they have a big music section. They used to. I think they're out of business now. But so I just went to there. You know, the, what's the chance of there being anything, anything interesting there? But I just went to their international section, mm-hmm. and I was trying. I was like, dude, Jake. I could see Jake skating to something weird. You know, it needed to be something that that was like not what you know you saw in fucking every video you know yeah, couldn't yeah. be definitely not hip-hop you know like rock and roll like what the hell are you gonna mm. and so i just saw this random thing and it, it was called dj cheb i sabah and it, it was like some like indian like hindu kind of like art on the front and it said something about electronic and i was like all right who knows yeah, yeah. and like you know when you the cd they play the first 10 seconds and you're like mm, no i thought it was a mitt and i just and then there was there with two songs on there where it was like it was just such a like a, you know a, a miraculous find you know for me with how yeah. much i had gone through music to try to find something and just how um it's actually his parts two songs it's one song and then i i spliced in a piece of of one of the other songs on that album for his like slow motion section oh but, yeah uh, but yeah it's one of like my proudest like finds you know just because mm. it's such a random strange thing you know for sure yeah 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 so let's see, I have another few questions from Brian. So he said, what's your favorite place to travel? Oh, that's a tough one. I'm sure there's a bunch, but... Uh... I know, I know. I don't, I don't travel as much except for... It's mostly just domestic, you know, yeah. for skating. I mean, it depends. Like, he didn't specify skating. No, or, no, he just said, uh, yeah. But like, for example, the, in the recent trips you did premiering Static, was there one destination that kind of uh, stuck out? 
Well, I mean, uh, Japan, you know, we spent a lot of time in Japan because they did uh, a lot of premieres there. And, yeah. and um, I'd never spent a lot of time there. And it was that was really uh, that's definitely been my favorite, you know, destination of the past like 10 years, at least because the uh, just culturally, you know, like, yeah, yeah. New York has gotten so um, it's so stressful. There's like there's so much garbage everywhere. And people have kind of like the simple rules of society, like, you know, trying to like stay on the right side of the sidewalk or, you know, people biking the wrong direction down the street and all, you know, little simple things really went down the tubes through the the pandemic and everything. And so Japan was like a real nice dose of like respectful, you know, people being respectful and orderly. And um, so I, I really enjoyed that. Sure. Yeah, I'm sure. And also the skate scene over there is just incredible. Yeah, yeah, it's really. What brands are you working with? Like Evison, right? And uh, is there another one? Evison and Tight Booth. Oh, Tight Booth. That's right. Yeah, because Tight Booth's out of um, out of the same place as Evison. Okay. Um, So yeah, I mean it's 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 just amazing to see Japan finally get some credit. You know, yeah, yeah after being ignored for so long yeah yeah yeah, for sure yeah no it's i feel like now it's really kind of getting the acknowledgement it rightfully deserves totally uh, he asked who really killed jfk oh my God. <laughs> if you want this to ever end i don't think we should <laughs> yeah should we just avoid this one <laughs> um that's always cha- i mean I, I won't go into it but that's like there's no, you know, there's no easy answer for that one, but it's, that is the best, like, if anybody, because people have been like, why are you upset, you know, interested, or why are you upset? It's like, why are people interested in true crime, or why are people interested in mystery and thrillers? It's yeah, the, yeah. the JFK assassination story is, it's the most perplexing and mysterious, like, labyrinth of any story and it's true you know what i mean mm, and, it, yeah, and it had yeah. this massive effect yeah this massive ripple effect on not just the Amer- american history but the rest of the world and and it's it's just the implications of if the cia and and the mob and you know were were actually involved in orchestrating it like the implications of that are are insane you yeah. know and there's so m- so it's just one of those things it's like you'll never really know exactly you know for sure but yeah, man yeah, yeah. it is such a, I, I just recently, like literally this week, <laughs> I've been reading and listening to some stuff that changed some of the things, the, my original thoughts about it. it like some new, okay. some new information that I never heard before. That's, um, it's just so fucking fascinating because it's just the CIA was so, you know, there's things that are publicly known about this, what the CIA was doing in the 60s, you know, that are atrocious, you know, and mm-hmm. crazy. Like aside from just them literally overthrowing, you know, democratic elected uh, leaders in, in South and Central America and Iran and like the mind control programs that, that it came out that they you know basically admitted to performing and it's just mm. the amount of crazy shit they were doing in the 60s the fact that people could actually believe that Lee Harvey Oswald was just some lone nut who just happened to you know yeah. like pull it off by himself is it's insane it's just <laughs> a, so it's so to me it's like it's weird because it's like I'm not like the main maniac about like that conspiracy stuff like i used to be but i you're still interested uh of course yeah i mean it's just so it's it's such an incredible story and it's like Mm. and when you dive into it it's like like i said it's like a i don't know i hate to use harry potter example because i was never into harry potter but it's (laughs) like or star wars you know where it's just this such a deep world of different avenues and each character you know there's so many like each Jesus Christ, the guy, you know, there's like, you can pick one of, of any of these characters. They have this long history of other things they were involved in, you know, where you're just like, anyways, <laughs> I could go on forever. That's yeah, another yeah, podcast. Yeah. <laughs> what else did he ask? He asked, favorite spot to skate in Tampa. Do you oh, have one man. that comes to mind? Well, they tore it out. Oh, they finally okay. tore it out. Yeah. It was this, anybody who like, any friends who actually pay attention to my Instagram know of it, but it's just some really miserable parking lot where the blacktop parking lot that's all cracked and, you know, faded from the sun. Just this tiny little mini manual pad that mm-hmm. was just so much fun. You know, just, just high enough where it's like you do a trick and it's legit, but it's like short enough or lengthwise, you know, where you don't have to hold it super long. Okay. 
but man, it is miserable in the summer. It's like you could die. You can literally <laughs> die because there's no shade. Oh, yeah, yeah. But uh, I love, for some reason, I love all those really shitty skate spots from Tampa that I, you know, got stuck skating when I was a kid. I love going back to them now. And uh, it's just so much fun. I don't know why, but I, I, yeah, that's all I, that's I, all I want to do. nostalgia from your childhood or something. Yeah, yeah. 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 He asked uh, another thing. He asked, who's the umbrella man on the grassy knoll? <laughs> Did I say that right? Yeah, yeah. I was oh, like, what man. the hell is that? <laughs> That's a, I recently did a post about it on the Theories, Theories brand um, Instagram. I missed that one. It's a, again, it's, I don't want to get, I could go really heavy into it, but it's just one of these re weird characters involved in the JFK assassination. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, would, like right before the gunshots started ringing out, there's this strange guy. It's a sunny day on Dealey Plaza is where the plaza that it, the murder uh, yep, happened. Yep. But this guy stands up And he has he starts opens an umbrella and he's opening it and closing it and spit and then twirling it in a weird pattern right as this assassination started occurring. And supposedly, you know, different accounts say different things, but they say he was opening it up like in sequence with the gunshots like he was oh. like he was blatantly involved in some way as either like a signal guy or and then the wow. Damn. they actually had like. It's a lot. I won't go into, <laughs> into it too far. <laughs> But it's just one of, you know, there's all these interesting characters, like, just, just in the bystanders that were there. Like, that guy, he disappeared for years and nobody could find him. There's, like, this lady, they call her the Babushka lady, who's a, a lady who's in photos. Stand she was the closest person to Kennedy when he was shot. And she's just a character that nobody could, um, you know, there's theories about her and, and mm. nobody could ever track her down. And, then, you know, it's just interesting. Yeah, it looks like a rabbit hole for sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, next one is from, so I'm gonna butcher his name, but he was in the latest static video. John Baragwanath, is that how you yeah, say it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Baragwanath? Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But his part was sick though, I really, really enjoyed him. Sick. I didn't know about him, to be honest, before I, I checked out Static 6. Oh, cool. I was really amazed by his part. Like, the whole video is great, but his part really stuck out to me. Nice, good. So he asked a couple of things. He said, ask him about three flipping over this rail into bank and why he was getting so mad. There's something to do with a bunch of ants in the roll up <laughs> and him not wanting to kill them because he was in his Satori phase. Oh <laughs> so that was in Satori static one, right? Phase. The tray flip. Yeah, I went. It's funny because the first, maybe the second time I drove to California, I can't remember what. One of my cross country trips, we went to that spot with like Scott Conklin and uh, my friend Corey and uh, James. And I, I did it then on that trip, and they somebody filmed it, mm -hmm. and it was it was filmed really badly, and okay. it was like you know for me as like a person who never I never get to skate spots I was always having to film you know that mm -hmm. was like it was the best thing I street thing I'd ever done so I was like I have to go back and redo this with like yeah. a, the a good with the fish because I didn't I don't think we had the death lens yet at the one the first time we went so on that static one trip with Jake Rupp and everybody I like you know manipulated us to <laughs> into going back it's all the way it's in New Mexico And uh, yeah, I started trying it again and Joel Meinholz was filming it with the VX for me. And, you know, it's just like, I'm doing something that I'm positive I'm going to get hurt on, you know, and I've already done it. So I'm like, I'm already like also thinking like, fuck, dude, I shouldn't be trying, you know. So I get really like when I try something, if I film a trick, I lose my I absolutely lose my mind. Like anybody, yeah. if I try something, I warn everybody in advance. I'm like, hey, I'll still be happy afterwards. Don't worry. But you're going to think that I'm channeling the devil. <laughs> I'm, it's all fine, but yeah. I'm going to lose my shit. And then the other side of it is, is Rupp and, and Ed's Lego. They're just skating for fun and they're shredding. They're like doing stuff. And I keep, I'm tripping because I'm like, I should be filming these guys. Yeah. I'm like, I oh, yeah. just fucking landed. I got to film these guys. Yeah. You know, and then right as I'm like getting close, I notice there's a, a, you know a chain of ants they've formed a line <laughs> yeah. right where i pop my tail and then i'm like i hate killing anything you know yeah, like, yeah. I, i don't kill cockroaches even though i hate them so i'm picturing i'm like dude i'm about to do something that i could get really hurt on mm -hmm. and then i'm killing a bunch of things right as i pop so i was like i can't so i kept trying to like wave them out of the way and then they'd <laughs> reform they'd reform their lines so i was like fucking losing my shit <laughs> 
Wow. So the universe was telling you not to do it. Or... <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I and I really read into all that stuff. I'm like, you know, like if the wind blows weird, I'm like, oh, that's that's God telling me I shouldn't. <laughs> not God, but the universe or something telling me I shouldn't do it. Right. But uh, thank God I I got it. And then I gave myself a slow mo of it in stack. <laughs> <laughs> he said also he loves to give people shit about buying stuff at delis that are bottled or wrapped in plastic <laughs> he's really trying to not use plastic in his life and i think it's pretty commendable and he'd probably love to talk about it like if you buy a shirt from theories it comes in some weird biodegradable plastic you can boil away yeah he's like it's funny because he knows it drives me like I don't want to be too controlling and, comp you know, comment on people like what they're doing with their lives or, you know, but sure, yeah. on on road trips, it's like so hard not to use plastic, you know, and it's like people are, are dying of thirst. So then they go into. So John, he kind of like fucks with me about it because he knows how much like plastic is drives me crazy, you know, because yeah. I mean, it's such a already obviously a massive problem but it's gonna get so much worse where just yeah. everything is fucking packaged in plastic and all that every ounce of it goes into the oceans it's like yeah. no matter how we try to control it and so road trips are like especially frustrating because everybody's just buying all especially when somebody buys one of those like 24 packs of bottled waters and brings them in the van and i'm just like oh <laughs> my god dude like because i mean i always you know it's so easy to just have a water bottle with you and just refill it but nobody yeah. wants the responsibility of like having i don't know so john john i'm always giving him a real hard time about <laughs> <laughs> So what's the story with the biodegradable plastics? So you wrap, uh, like, for example, the T-shirts or, like, some of the gear that you sell yeah. through theories. You, you try to use, like, more biodegradable uh, stuff? It's just such a bummer. But it's, like, it's an unavoidable part of a clothing company or yeah. clothing business is you can't sell shirts without them being packaged in some way to protect them, you know, and mm -hmm. especially shipping overseas and all this shit. So for years, we tried to find a solution. And as we finally found a place where it's like, basically, the idea is pretty much every plastic bag ends up in the ocean. Like I just said, you know, yeah, it's like, yeah. especially in New York, like trash just gets blown by the wind. And it's just unavoidable. So these bags, they don't biodegrade immediately. But an average plastic bag, I think takes something like seven years to biodegrade. But um, okay, these bags our bags take something like if it makes it if it ends up in the ocean it'll biodegrade after like seven months or something like that okay. or you can put it in um you can boil it in hot water and it just disintegrates in hot water oh okay okay so at least it's like it's it's still not a perfect solution no you know, but it's but better it's, definitely better. Yeah, yeah at least it's something but i just it, i feel is it more expensive though like for you yeah as it's a, a lot yeah. more expensive okay it's yeah, like I guess so. yeah. it's like 50 cents a bag or something like that so we you know we lose money to do it but it's like i'd rather at least feel a little bit better about it you know yeah i i salute the, the effort for sure no i think it's yeah. important okay i have a question then from jordan trahan who had the last part in the static six video and he said who was your favorite to work with on static six <laughs> <laughs> oh my god apart from jordan let's say <laughs> Oh, loaded man. question. That's definitely a loaded question. Jordan was one of the last people to get involved in the video. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed filming with Jordan in New Orleans because at first I did that wasn't part of the plan because I didn't think New Orleans had enough skate spots to kind of carry a full part. Mm -hmm. But after the first trip there, I was like, I really liked crafting, you know, working with him to craft a part that that was very, you know, New Orleans centric, yeah, you yeah. know, and kind of give people that feeling of being in New Orleans and the, the kind of the, the unique character that that city has. So mm. that was definitely super enjoyable and working, you know, Jordan's just so, um, you know, his style, yeah. his presence, Incredible. he's got like a, yeah, he's got something, you know, that, that is, is very rare. So it, it was a, a real treat working with him. But all, you know, the guys in the videos, they're people that like, I, I like them as people and that's why yeah. they're, you know, but yes, it helps that they're, they're dope, you know, rad skaters and blah, blah, blah. But they're like, you know, they're people like John is like, John's like that Joe Brooke guy. It's like, we've, I've said it so many times in our, like in our friend circle or whatever, that as long as jo if John's on a trip, I know it's going to be enjoyable. Even if we don't get any footage, it's just like, yeah. you know, just this, that sweet slash funny, you know, like keeps it light. And so everybody in the video is, you know, mm. like <laughs> can't pick a, <laughs> pick a favorite, but 
All right, so let's do the next one. This one is an audio one. Nice. Mr. Josh, you're pretty well known for traveling to some odd links to document skateboarding over the years. Um, one of my fondest memories is always our time traveling up the Amazon back in 2010. We had a great crew, amazing destination, very difficult to document and just to get clips in general, considering the environment, you know, skate trip up the river. But um, that said, any big takeaways from that trip in particular? And as a follow-up, what are your three top skate destinations over the years? Then as a follow-up, follow, follow up, <laughs> no. what can you tell us about Cup of Joes? <laughs> Were those indeed the best days of our lives? <laughs> Missy, bud. <laughs> wow. Jack's are back. Yes. I didn't recognize his voice at, at first. I haven't, I haven't talked to him in a while. One of the best styles in skateboarding. Yeah, yeah, he's a he's another one. He's a great a great dude. I lived with him for a while too. Oh yeah, um, in Brooklyn. Yeah, I mean those are some those are some long questions to <laughs> answer. So I'm trying to yeah. figure. The cup of Joe's one's funny. The Amazon trip. Yeah, I mean Jesus, John Maring set that trip up and yes, um, the skateboarder right trip. Yeah. Yeah, the idea of it. Of course, I wanted to go, but the idea of of like how to shoot, you know, like a full project on like HD. I brought my Bolex to mm -hmm. sailing down the Amazon and skating, you know, little towns <laughs> off of it was pretty daunting. But like the India trip, you know, it's like one of those things. It's like very trying in a lot of ways, and then because of that, it creates the best memories, you know, yeah, and, and yeah. makes it just such a special. And that the crew on that trip was insane. You know, it was like Kenny Anderson, Jack, yeah, Jack, Kenny Anderson, Maring, who's awesome, uh, Jake Johnson, Adelmo, which I had never oh, tried. Yeah. He's fucking again. Talk about positivity, yeah. you know, just having somebody who's like always happy and like so so rad. Joey Pepper, you know, like oh yeah, yeah, yeah. What a like amazing crew. Yeah, um, that's true. So that was, I mean, I could go on and on for, about that. That and that's one of those things. It's it's a bummer because it was like released on Skateboarder Mag's website. So it's one of those things that didn't really live on. You know, like it was yeah. like a nine part, ten part. I always talked about combining it all into one piece and then making you know put it on our our YouTube channel. Yeah, it's like. The proper documentary yeah i saw there was a like some b-roll or i don't know what it's uh like on the toa website like youtube page there was a uh, like some footage oh. of that whole trip was there yeah i knew i put it's like a 20, 20 I... something minute edit with a bunch of footage from from oh. that time oh do you know what that was i think i found on one of my old hard drives that was like i just put all the footage in a timeline when i got home okay. to send to everybody so they could see everything right and so i found that i found that and put it up on youtube i guess okay so it was like just kind of like raw footage without yeah, yeah. The interviews exactly and all that. Cause i did a, a bunch of interview and also i did a, a fuel tv episode with kenny anderson during that trip so okay. it was like this doing you know interviews with him and then crazy somebody committed suicide on our off the boat when we were on that trip somebody no in the, the the boat captain told us that that happens kind of often people come not i don't know about often but it's happened before people decide they're going to kill themselves but they're going to do it by jumping off into the amazon like and just Damn. drowning or dying in the amazon and some guy did it overnight and it was crazy wow um, but yeah that was pretty dark yeah wow yeah um, the cup of Joe's thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dude, when I first, I mean, the first few years I lived in Brooklyn, I hung out with Jack a lot, with Bobby Puglio and Steve Brandy after he moved there. And then Jamal, like after a couple years, became part of like my regular circle. But we would go, I would meet Bobby near his house at this little bagel and coffee shop called Cup of Joe. Okay. And the dude who run it ran it was this guy from East New York, and he was a rapper. His name was DJ Dognuts. <laughs> he was, wow, he was okay. he was awesome, but he was like really like uh, really dry, you know, like dude. And he he had a little bit of patience for Bobby's personality. But we we would hang out there, and it, we'd always walk there, and on a Monday, and forget that they were closed on a Monday. So I'd get all the way there and be like, fuck. So on a Tuesday, <laughs> one day we were talking to the owner and we're like, and Bob's like, yo, Elliot, that was the owner's name. He's like, you should just let Josh and I open this place on Mondays for you. And he's like, I, he's like, I'll see you here. He's like, uh, I'll, I'll meet you here Monday morning at 5am. We'll go to get you. And I was like, 
oh, are we really going to do this? And then we actually, we actually showed up. And I remember like driving to the, this place they call Restaurant Depot. And it's where like restaurants buy all their, you know, bulk yeah. product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the sun was coming up behind Manhattan. And we were listening to DJ Dog Nuts like CD going over this bridge. And I was just like, <laughs> and Bobby Puglio's in the front seat of this car. And I'm like, dude, is this really <laughs> my, what new, the hell are we doing? my new life? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, um, so I, I was the barista and Bobby was the cook and he just like was, sh- you know, like his <laughs> hair, his greasy ass hair all like hanging in the, you know. Wow. And it that only lasted for a few, mo- like maybe two months. And the owner, I think, just saw us like running the place and was like, probably like, what the fuck am I doing? He, he, yeah. he, he was nervous. He didn't like the idea of us running it. So he would show up while we were there. To make sure then, everything you know, was running smoothly. Or? Yeah, yeah. But it was pretty funny. Short lived. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> Wow, yeah. so random. Okay, then I have a few questions from Kuba Kaczmarczyk. Kuba from uh, The Great Area videos yeah. from Poland. So he asked a couple things. He said, is there any skater that was in all the static videos? Yes, there's several. There are several. I'm pretty sure. This is like a trivia like question. Jamal, so. maybe? No, Jamal's close, but no. He wasn't in two or one or two. I'm pretty sure Joel Meinholtz. Oh, yeah. Because he has a part in the first one and a part in the fourth one. And then he's um, he's got to be in all of them. Mm. He's got to. Ed Salego? Steve Brandy. No, I'm not Ed Salego because he wasn't in the last two. He stopped skating kind of like after we finished the uh, MIA. Welcome to MIA video. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was, what, 2010 around there? Yeah, yeah. But I think Steve Brandy and Joel Meinholz are for sure. Okay. Because Steve was like, Steve's been on on like on road trips and filming trips for every video, just because he's kind of just became kind of like my closest friend, kind of, and yeah. always involved. Pat and Steiner, then, no? No, he was in the second one, but he wasn't in the first one. So Pat's been in, yeah, he's been everyone since, except for the first one. Okay. I think, and I noticed German German Nieves or German oh, yeah. Nieves. Yeah, he was in almost every one. I think, except for this most recent one. I was hoping to get footage from the uh, Paul Young, who's working on his own video down by law. So right. he's working on his own video. He was gonna give me footage, and then he just decided he needed to keep it. So that was okay. I think jo- German was in every video except for this most recent one. But Steve and J- Jamal, I'm pretty. Sure, I mean, sorry, Steve and Joel. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. think were. They're the only ones I can think off the top of my head. There might be yeah, some. Yeah, there might else, be some but... other ones. Yeah. Okay. I always try. You know, there's like staple guys. Like I wanted Force Force Kirby. I, oh, yeah. Ideally, I wanted you know certain guys that became like they're in the first one and they were like they're like family. You know, yeah, Joel, yeah. Steve, Forrest are family. Like Paul Zitzer. But it, you know, at a certain point, it becomes you know, impossible for me to say, okay, I'm going to fly down to you know, yeah, yeah, whatever. I actually, I I think Ken Anderson might have been in every one too. Was he in the latest one? Yeah, I used a clip that I found. Oh, of him yeah, like an old clip from '99 or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah '99. Yeah. That's what it is. '99. Yeah, with yeah. a switch flip manual at the end or something like that. Uh, maybe not that, but uh, like uh, it's a line switch flip with switch a... nose wheelie. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah, but it wasn't like a recent clip. Yeah. No, no. I planned on. I meant to. I was gonna go to L.A. to try to get stuff with him and Montoya and Vincent Alvarez and like all those guys who were. I consider kind of like family as well, you know, but mm-hmm. it just, I, I had that back problem that like sciatic, uh, problem that raised up on like early this spring or last spring. And I couldn't, I couldn't even film. So okay, ended up canceling on that. Maybe for static seven. Yeah. Kuba asked also, who is the most challenging slash hard skater out of the group having a part in static videos to film? Hmm. That's kind of different. I've I've answered that question quite a few times and said Bobby because Bobby and I, you know, Bobby's very like careful about what he's involved in and how he's portrayed. Yeah. So that more came down with Bobby and I, it more came down to editing his part. And that's mm-hmm. where yeah. it was a you know, really big struggle. Filming, that's different. Mm-hmm. I don't know. There's no, I mean, I, like I said, I'm, I'm mostly, people become end up having static parts because I like them. Yeah. You know, mostly sure. I like them as people. Yeah. So it's rare for me to have, uh, for it to be a struggle. Danny Renaud was like, you know, he was a little tough to, in certain capacities at the time. Mm -hmm. He just has a strange way. He doesn't like, he, 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 ideally I think he'd be better off just me filming with him, you know, just like one filmer or one skater and, and me. And he was on a lot of, he was on some trips with us. And it was, I just remember that being a little bit tricky because he would kind of, you know, 
But that was, you know, that was, uh, I feel like he, I don't feel like he was drunk on one when he was like on those filming trips or stuff, but he was, um, he was in that time when he was still drinking and stuff and, you know, it was a little more difficult, but he's, yeah, you know, people who don't know these guys and they hear stories about him, but Danny's like, he's just one of the wittiest and funny, you know, funniest. He's fun to be around because he's so fucking funny and his skating is like one of the sickest styles. Yeah, 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 definitely. Whatever. Kuba asked also, why is there no Euroheads in Static 6? <laughs> um, I wanted Static 6 to be... I don't know, it's tough because there's a theme to the Static 6 video, but I feel like it's better... Like, I was going to, like, explain the theme, you know, in, in future interviews and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, you know what? I think it's better with that stuff for people to interpret things on their own. Mm-hmm. But there is obviously a, a theme throughout the video of it being about America, you know, to a certain yeah. degree. Like, I'll just say it loosely in the the video specifically. The parts are from people around the whole perimeter, you know, basically around the entire country. Yeah. You know, there's nobody from the very center, but, you know, New Orleans, Florida, New York, Chicago, you know, L.A. Mm-hmm. So it kind of didn't make sense. You know, that was the theme. So it wouldn't have made sense to pull somebody from out, out of yeah, overseas. But mm-hmm. Yeah. And also it's just right in my time these days, the past like 10 years or especially the past like five, six years, I just wouldn't have the ability to be traveling like that anymore, you know, because I'm just all my time goes to theaters in Atlantis and then I film on the weekends, you know, so. Yeah, 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 yeah. Kind of linked to that. He said, who are the top five European skaters of all times? (laughs) <laughs> oh my god another impossible question <laughs> yeah i mean tom penny is like i'm i'm from that era or tom oh, sure. penny is like a you know his that era that peak penny era was like it was godlike mm-hmm. you know what i mean like you can't i mean there's there's so many incredible i mean how that's like <laughs> the, sure. europe is pre, pretty big yeah. you know what i mean how do you choose european skaters i like it's rad that you have these guys like like Kuba's one of the you know these uh, select dudes from around the world who've been like a champion of independent skate video you know like yeah. representing a whole country basically yeah being the voice of an entire country's skate scene I'm sure there's other people in Poland filming and doing stuff but Kuba's been like a big voice for his scene for yeah, so long definitely. and and yeah. got tons of respect for him and a lot of you know a lot of these guys you're you know getting involved in this so I really appreciate having questions from them yeah, but yeah european yeah. is tough, <laughs> it's yeah. tough for me to make a whole list because there's so many jan clewer was somebody i was a big fan oh of. yeah he was yeah. he was gonna have a static three part oh and, really um, yeah he actually films he was trying to film some stuff but it just you know it was like at that era where he was he was a dad he was trying oh, you yeah. know he was, he was working and i could tell I, I didn't pressure him but he was down and then it just kept not working you know and i wasn't able to come to berlin at the time oh, that's too and bad it just, it like yeah he's yeah. one of my favorites yeah oh, that yeah he's been really so sick, sick. I think Soy Pande might, somebody, somebody kind of clued me in on like, I knew his, you know, of course I knew who he was yeah, um, through cliche. cliche and stuff, but then somebody kind of was like, hey, pay attention, you know, like, look at, take a look. And then I was like, damn, dude, he is really fucking sick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Danny Wainwright's another guy where it's just a yeah. style that I, I caught on later where I was like, fuck, man, I wish I had asked Danny to do a part back in the day because his style was so unique and... Mm. Yes, the last thing you said, weren't you afraid of changing the lineup from very diverse sponsor-wise to almost TOA only? Mm. Does this make sense? Like, uh, in the sense that from the lineup in your videos? um, I understand what it means. That's a misconception, and I knew that would be probably, that's what people would assume. The only, everybody in this new static video, none of them ride for TOA brands except for the wheel brand. And the reason okay. for that, or well, Steve and Jamal were like, you know, obviously they've been, they've been in the past, <laughs> Steve been in every video, yeah. has nothing to do. The static videos are absolutely, the whole, the point of it is it's an independent Independence, video. yes, yes it's, for sure. It's not supposed to be a sales tool, but the problem is. I start filming and traveling with these guys. I'm in vans with them. I'm on the, you know, walking across Manhattan for months and years on end. Eventually, like this new video, Trevor Thompson, it's just like they become people that I'm around constantly and I like so much that we invite them to ride, you know, like I want them to be involved. Sure. So Dial Tone was our wheel brand was kind of the brand that wasn't really fully, we hadn't fully built out the team. So Jordan was started having a static part before he rode for dial tone trevor had a static part before he read oh, for okay. dial tone i see so th- that was like it's very very loosely you know they're mm. connected but it wasn't the that's not 
the intent. But Static pulled them into being a part of the brand, of the right. real brand later. Okay, I see. Right, right. But there's that's, that's kind of like why, you know, like I've always tried to think out of the box of like getting people that people wouldn't expect to be in a Static video or, um, you know, like I tried. The only one that kind of makes sense, I guess, in his argument with the last video was, I mean, there are a lot of people who end up being involved, but it's like, the original lineup, you know, there's like Snowy, you know, and he wasn't involved and Charlie Young wasn't involved in it. You know, some of them were involved for brand with brands that had nothing to do with us anymore, you know, but it's, it's not about, so I really don't want people that, you know, that's, I know that's a tricky thing. Yeah. It, it, most people probably don't give a shit, but to me, I want static to remain looking like an independent, you know, it's an independent yes. thing. It's not a sales tool for, cause people have suggested people and I'm like, well, that looks like we're trying to sell, you know, mm, and it, it's yeah. sure it's mutually beneficial, but like no offense, but our wheel brand is not going to, you know, having parts in, in our vid, if some of the dudes who ride for a wheel brand, it's not like we're like, we're going to sell tons of wheels as a result of, you know what I mean? It's, yeah, it's, no, probably not. It's not no. the way things work <laughs> in skate business, but there's no big like camera going towards the wheels at the end right, of, the, right. of a trick or something. No. Like, no. Yeah, but it's interesting. I, I was thinking about that when I saw his question. I was like, oh, really? Like, uh, are all of the guys associated to a theories of Atlantis brand in some way? Not all of them. I mean, there's like Brian Powderly doesn't ride for any of our brands. And Brett does, technically doesn't really. Brett rides for Studio. We help Studio do distribution in the U.S. Right. It's clear. I mean, there's no business advantage. You know, it's not. And uh, I've been filming with Brett before he rode for studio. He was going to, I started working on his part in 2016 before he even got on studio. We were flowing in polar boards at the, at, for oh, yeah. a little while just so he could have some boards, you know, like it's not. Okay. Anyway, obviously that, that like, I know he doesn't mean that in a, in a negative no, way, no, no, no. but I just, you know, for me, it's like, obviously I didn't start doing static videos and do, you know, for 15 years, do them fully Building independent. Building to this uh, momentum yeah. of being <laughs> yeah. able to finally, <laughs> right. <laughs> we're there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, he finished uh, with uh, just a message. He said, when I watched the surprise part in Static 6, I was as stoked as when I saw this guy for the first time in First Division Industry section in 411. The blunt slide at love. Sick. That's right. Okay. Next one is from Eric Swisher from uh, The Chrome Ball Incident. Cool. He asked, I had no idea that you filmed so much of the Skate Park of Tampa ramp stuff with Mike Frazier. Obviously his Cigar City part, which is excellent, but also his Tin Can Folklore part. How was that experience for you, especially so early on in your career? Do you like the controlled ease of shooting vert in a park or would you rather be out in the streets? Would you like to film another vert part at some point? Yeah, that's... The, um... In hindsight, obviously, it's a honor to have anything to do with some stereo stuff because those first couple stereo videos were so Iconic. incredible and, and yeah, especially a visual sound. And Mike's, you know, like I said, it, anybody over, I hate to say over 40, but it's true, who has any, you know, somewhat decent taste is going to name Mike as one as in their top three vert skaters, mm -hmm. you know, and, yeah. and a lot of people, I know a lot of people just say he's their favorite skater. He's just such a, a sick style and like approach to skate, to vert skating. Him and Zitzer, you know, they both like, they, the way they skated, like the lip tricks they did on stuff they did on the coping, you know, instead of like, oh, I'm going to go go really high and do or really you know technical like they just yeah. put together lines that like kind of like a street skater sensibility which is yeah. kind of weird to say but but the, the first skating you know is a different filming technique for sure it was, yeah it was, we, it's 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 uh i did i filmed a lot of vert which is, is strange i guess to people who are used to just like static videos but um yeah I enjoyed it because, you know, it was like, like I said, it was different. And, and at the time when I was doing it, I didn't like at a certain point when you've done, you've know, done something for a long time, you, you have to, you feel like you have to overanalyze the way you go about it. because you feel like people are going to judge it with mm. more of a, you know, but at the time I was like, it was mostly new and, and I don't think anybody knew of, of, they weren't going to watch this stuff and know who filmed it or care who filmed it. So it, it was fun to experiment with and stuff. And, uh, and yeah, I, that, I was thinking that, you know, it's like I planned on, again, Mike's been actually skating a lot, um, in Florida these past couple of years, um, oh, at cool. a ramp that's like, it's like an hour North of where my mom lives. So when I've been down here visiting her, I kept being like, fuck, I need to get up and film something with Mike for static six, you know, it'd be really cool for him to be in the, in the montage. And it's just one of those things. It just didn't happen. Okay. 
but I agree. Like, you know, it's, it's, it'd be a cool, like out of the box thing that yeah, some people yeah. would be like, Oh, why, why was that in there? And then other people would be super stoked, you know? Yeah. 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 For sure. Mike's another one too. Who's a great storyteller. He's got some amazing stories and he's always fun to like, we used to play, uh, do these poker nights, what we played blackjack, but we'd play blackjack at, uh, Paul Zitzer's house all night long. Mm-hmm. And Frazier, Frazier would just keep it the whole time going with like, with great stories because he's been around the world quite a bit from the his pro career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got one of the gnarliest, like, remember when Transworld used to do those things where it would show all the injuries somebody was, has had? They'd have that Leonardo da Vinci style, fo- you know, like, oh, thing yeah. of them, like, and Mike's list of injuries are insane. <laughs> the amount of things he's had surgery. He's had like nine knee surgeries and like a dozen oh, shoulder wow. surgeries and he's still shredding. It's crazy. Then I have a few questions from Jamal, Jamal Williams. Oh, cool. So he said, is there an era or time period during which you were filming for static videos that sound out to be the most fun period? And if so, mm. could you elaborate why? Yeah, that's tricky. I mean, there's, I, to me, it's like two things come to mind. And, and it, one is just like the fun of being out on the road, like those trips we did, like with uh, the first video, like with Rupp and Steve Brandy and Joel and Paul Zitzer, you know, just driving across the country and not knowing, you know, like it's that, that fun experience of, of not knowing what's get, we're going to find in these going into weird small towns, you know, and like yeah. we pulled over, like we'd see something like in a desert, you know, like literally like a, an exit, a town that's just a, like a gas station exit off the highway. And then like, we saw this like weird rail that came out of the ground, went across, went back down and Jake like got out and, and filmed that, you know, that was just so much fun. And, and being in the van for like a month, you know, is like such a an adventure it's stressful yeah it's stressful but it's awesome so mm. those memories i don't do those because i felt like static it, it kind of like it became obvious that the static video should be more like you know focused around cities and you know being on foot and uh that kind of experience but that was still a lot of fun and then i think i've said it to jamal and steve you know that i i miss the fun of us being out in like midtown filming for static four mm-hmm late at night because we used to you know before jamal had kids and before toa got to be like such a full-time commitment job for me mm-hmm. you know we'd be out filming like till two in the morning you know and just like till we couldn't we could barely walk you know and you get mm-hmm. home so exhausted but just that feeling of being in you know in manhattan at like you know one in the morning and and not knowing what's going to be around the corner and just you know that is so so rad just that feeling of being in yeah. such a significant city in the middle of the night and, and you kind of own the streets, you know, but, yeah, but, yeah. you know, there's still like weirdos and weird shit happening, you know? So that was, that's fun. I look back on that era, you know, with a lot of fondness and, and, uh, you know, missing it a little bit. Yeah. 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 Do you get to do that at all these days? Like filming super late in New York? Do you yeah, get that same depends. feeling kind of, or? Uh, yeah, yeah, it just depends. You know, it's like the tough thing is like for me too is is the mystery of a lot of like New York City has isn't as mysterious. You know, because yeah, it's like yeah, been You've we've been here for a while. Down. I'm always. I'm always like with my girlfriend, I'll be like, okay, you know, I'll tell her. Yeah, I've been on this street, like, you know, I was here like 10 years ago. And I, you know, there's, I know where, you know, I'm not saying I'm some expert, but I've been on almost every street, every, you know, like, but there's, there's still tons, you know, there's obviously sure, stuff. If, yeah, you, yeah. if you like, Steve's always like creeping into like jumping fences into like some weird areas to find stuff. There's still stuff to be found for sure. But it's just like the mystery of it is, isn't as, as significant. Yeah. But I still like Steve and I, like for this video, there's some stuff we had to go to really late, you know, to wait for businesses to close or traffic to go. So he, his section, I, I just think night footage is far more compelling, you know, and uh, yeah. um, so I, I love it. But it's just so, you know, with TOA, like I'll seriously, like I'll finish working at like 10 or 9.30, you know, on weeknights. And then it's just like, fuck, man, <laughs> I don't know if I have it in me to get, you know, I have, I have gone out and done it, you know, but it's, it's, it's not as easy for sure anymore. Okay. Jamal also asked, could you name two skaters that you wanted to be featured in a static video, but never happened and why? And you just mentioned earlier, uh, Jan Cleaver. Yeah. Is there anybody else that comes to mind? Um, yeah, I think I've mentioned it somewhere before, but, um, Brian Brown was going to have a static three part as well. Both of those guys were for static three, I think. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, Brian was, was super down. And then the first trip that we did for that video was uh, we got an apartment in Miami for a month and he was supposed to fly down. And I think the day he said he was gonna fly down, <laughs> He, was, uh, he said, I think he had a ticket, but he was supposed to fly in that day. And he called me and he's like, yo, um, and, and he's like, Transworld asked me to do a part for their video. And I oh, feel no. like <laughs> I can't. Yeah. And so he ended up having to do that. And then says, you know, I'm still friends with him and we'll see him like, uh, he works for Ace, uh, Oh, trucks yeah. and yep. Mesa, their distributor or whatever. But uh, so I'll talk to him through there, you know, and he'll, we, we uh, reminisce on, you know, oh, mm. you should have had that part, man. I wish yeah. you, you know, been a, <laughs> he just, you know, a super unique style, you know, yeah. he really, he really used street spots super well. He would have been a rad, you know, addition to the series. Okay. And then he asked uh, Jamal, the last question from him is, why did you continue to work with a VX1000 camera throughout the static series and not something more current for the times? Mm. And I think that's, that's something that's come up a lot in the questions. Not until now, but uh, a lot of people have asked about the VX. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've probably spoken about it a lot too, but it's just the series is, is very kind of like based in kind of that era of like the golden era of like East Coast skating in the 90s and, and kind of like, I think it kind of lends itself like street skating to me, especially like night footage and like and skating in cities. It just, I grew up seeing it through that that camera, you know what I mean? And so yeah, yeah. to me, it still looks be the best for that. Mm -hmm. Also the, the aspect ratio matches the aspect ratio of 16 millimeter film uh, a oh, little yeah. more closely. Whereas with HD, I'd have to be cropping the 16 millimeter frame a little bit. And I just think this street skating, it looks better in the uh, four by three aspect ratio because things pass by the camera faster. Where the mm -hmm. HD, you know, you get this much wider frame. So it takes longer for things to pass through. So it makes it feel slower. Um, some people do a really good job with it and, and HD stuff. I mean, there's plenty of, of HD stuff that looks excellent and, you know, and, and super interesting. But I just feel like for static, it would be so weird for the, like, there to be an HD static video. Yeah, you know? it would be quite different, yes. Yeah, which would be cool to challenge what people expect, but I just think it it just fits it. But, you know, filming with VX is, has become so insanely frustrating. You know, they're just mm. like, they're breaking down, they're they're ancient, you know, there's yeah, so few people that can fix technology. them. They discontinued the Sony tapes, so finding that, it's just a, it's a shit show, you know. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> okay, this one is an audio one. For people that know you, they know that you don't drink or do drugs, but what was your only experience with a drug, if it's, I guess, classified as that? Uh, that's my girlfriend. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what she's referencing is, yeah, I've never, um, I don't drink, I've never been drunk, I've never done any drugs, I never was like interested in any of that. I mean, I, I thought... When I was younger, when I started skating, I thought all skaters didn't drink. I thought, I literally, I, I thought oh, yeah. it was like, because I thought skateboarding, I thought the culture of skateboarding was supposed to be like the antithesis anti establishment. of jock. Yeah, and anti-jock and anti, yeah. you know, like, and I as associated partying with jocks and this and that. So when I saw, I think it was when I saw, it was a four-on-one and there was a Halloween party that the girl chocolate guys were at and Costin and this guys, Costin was dressed up as Gigi uh, yeah. Allen and they're all drunk. It was so, I was like, no, I couldn't <laughs> believe it, you know? And yeah. so I had to like, it challenged the way, you know, I saw in all my, you know, I've, every static road trip, people have, you know, beers in the car and smoking weed, you know, sure. like I was forced, you know, a lot of things like the traveling and being forced to be less like of a germaphobe and stuff, you know, you're forced to kind of like ex understand things that you or become accepting of things, whatever. But just that it was never for me. And, uh, uh -huh. and I don't like seeing that kind of shit portrayed in videos, you know, because it's like, it's fine if that's what somebody's culture is. Like I loved like the anti-hero shit, you know, it's like mm. um, the early anti-heroes fucktards and all that stuff is, you know, such a window into like this crazy fucking world. <laughs> but when, when I saw it glamorized in, you know, companies using it as a selling point, you know, yeah, it's a little bit fucked up. I just up. think it's, yeah, I think it's pretty fucked considering how many people's lives have been. Teenagers by are it. watching that and thinking that it's the norm and it's the cool thing to do. And yeah, yeah. 
I mean, it happened a lot in the early 2000s, you yeah, know, for and, sure. and all those dudes who glamorized it are in, you know, a lot of them don't drink anymore because it fucked yeah. up their lives, you know, and it's like, but yeah, I don't, I'm not being preachy. I'm just saying, I no, don't no, like of course, seeing yeah, yeah. it. Just to give some context. So, you know, me telling this story, it's a little different than that because it's not, but basically I read this book, like there's this author who I've read every one of his books. His stuff is like always about like ancient civil, it's like a, a nonfiction writer. So it's always about like, you know, ancient history and like about Egypt and like alternate mm-hmm. theories of like the origins of civilization. So I, I picked up his recent, his latest book and uh, opened it up and started reading. And I was like, what the fuck? And the whole book was about him going to South America and Africa and sitting with shaman. And he was taking like ayahuasca and oh, doing yeah. like psychedelics. Okay. And it was more like he was kind of like investigating, is this world that you go to when you're in this state, is it actually a real, a real place? Is it a mm-hmm. real, like, is it just an imagination that the brain's concocting or is it actually something... And it's really, he makes a really good case for it because, you know, he's talking, he's like walking with medicine men in uh, the Brazilian Amazon and they're explaining how they, you know, this plant is deadly. Yeah. He's like, if you take this plant, you, it can kill you within an hour. But then this plant that looks exactly the same, like Grant, this author's like, there's no telling, he's like, this one is the, is the antidote to this snake's venom. And if it bites you, you will die unless you take this plant. And he's like, how did you learn this? And he said, this, we learn this in the spirit world when they're take, on ayahuasca. He's like, this, he, they consider it plant consciousness. You know, like the plants actually are sharing their consciousness with, you know, it's really super wow. interesting book. So I finished this okay. book. I swear to God, this is how it is. I finished this book at this coffee shop I used to go to all the time. And I was like, okay, this changes the way I see, you know, drug use to a certain degree, whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. And I said, if I ever find myself in the Amazon with a shaman, I would actually, I think I would do this, you know, like I oh, want to yeah, know, okay. I want to, I want to like, I'm willing to explore that. Yeah. Yeah. That same week. This guy who from Vice magazine called me and asked me if I would go up, if I could shoot on this trip to the Brazilian Amazon. And I was like, um, yeah, of course, you know. And then that trip turned into John Maring's trip. Like Vice got out of it and then it became a skateboarder mag trip. Right, right. So then I'm on that trip. And the last night we did this, at the end of this boat ride, we stopped on a uh, an island in the middle of the Amazon and we visited with a native tribe and they did a, a whole performance, you know, and like a ritual and like there was us and some, a few other tourists. And at one point the medicine or the, yeah, the medicine man or the shaman, the shaman of the tribe, he spoke through uh, Adelmo who was translating and he said, okay, anybody who wants to do ayahuasca, you sit on this bench and people who don't want to do ayahuasca sit on that bench. And it was like, okay. like this is like a couple weeks or a few weeks after I read this book yeah, and yeah, decided if I'm wow. in the Amazon with a shaman, I will do this. And I'm just yeah. like, the universe is I've calling, never even, buff- yeah. I've never even been drunk, you know? And I'm like, I have to do, I guess I have to do this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I sat, I was filming everything too for this. So I sat down on the bench and did like, you have to smoke this weird cigar thing he made and drink this absolutely putrid uh, stuff, <laughs> uh, ayahuasca he made. And I told every, cause Adelmo, somebody brought it up, was like, oh, what if like, if they offer us ayahuasca? And uh, I was like, people were like, oh, we, I would do it, I would do it. And I was like, just so you know, I was like, it's not fun. I was like, it's not going to be. And somebody's like, no, it's, it'll be. And I was like, no, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying I'm an expert, but I just finished this like 500 page book about it. Yeah. And it seems like it's, it's really awful, but mm. you can have an amazing experience. And we get back to the boat and literally every single person, well, first, the people who ran the boat uh, experience, they fed us a bunch of spaghetti, which is really weird okay. because the one thing that every single person who drinks ayahuasca does is pukes a bunch. Oh, so wow. okay. we ate and then everybody went up to the top of the boat and just started projectile puking uh, <laughs> oh spaghetti off the side of the boat. Every single person. Wow. And I, from reading that book, you know, I, I, what I understood from the book is if you hold back from puking, that's what will allow you to have the experience. So I try, I went and laid in a hammock and tried to like calm Keep myself down, down and yeah. not puke. Yeah. And I had some crazy, like super unbelievable, like visions of thing of, you know, really interesting stuff. And 
my takeaway from it was like I li- I it made me s- way more positive for like I mean it didn't last <laughs> but, but for like months after I didn't even notice until like you know a little ways in but I'm like the com- people ask me how I'm doing I'm usually like oh it's you know it's going good I mean you know and then I'm like always like jumping to this like I'm stressed at work or you yeah, know whatever yeah, yeah. like kind of being sure and I it had like retuned me to yeah, a certain okay, degree to being. I'm assuming maybe maybe that's not why maybe just the trip, but it just yeah. it it seemed like it had a, a profound a really uh, positive yeah mm. yeah but the it was a definitely a, a you know like the India thing it's something that was like super I'm super thankful yeah, for the yeah. experience you know did most of the people on the trip did they also do the ayahuasca with you or I think every I mean. I don't want to like air people's dirty laundry, but I'm pretty sure almost at, almost I mean, everybody. It's, uh, yeah, it's years ago, and it's uh, it's ayahuasca. It's not a heroin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Okay, yeah, but, interesting. Yeah, interesting. I think pretty much everybody did. All right, this one is from Zach Chamberlain. So he said, "Does the term underground skating mean anything to you? And if so, what? Or if not, why?" I mean, it's it's weird because like the the term underground skating, I feel like has changed significantly, you know, sure. because up until 2005, 2006, or let's just say before social media, underground skating was a very much more well-defined term because it, it, there were tons of people and scenes, you know, like I said, when I went in 98, when I went to Washington, D.C. to film for a Tampa video, we were just on a trip and we went to Pulaski and it was like this insanely well-developed, huge scene of incredibly talented skaters. And I had never heard of almost any of them, Mm -hmm. you know, and I was like, you know, I paid attention, you know, I watched every video and read every magazine. And basically my point is, I'm not saying that, that, that just because I didn't know about them doesn't mean that other people didn't, but just Mm. the, like up before social media, there were like full scenes that existed that weren't really on the radar of not just mainstream skateboarding, but most of skateboarding Mm -hmm. because getting access to the rest of the world was so much more difficult. Now everybody has access, you know, it's just sticking out and being remembered is, is what's more difficult. So now underground skating, you know, we we used to do a thing called underground skater of the year on our, on TOA. Oh yeah. Okay. Just to kind of counteract the thrasher thing. And it became difficult the past couple of years. We debate who qualifies as underground, you know, yeah, because yeah. there's skaters, I would say, oh, they're definitely underground because that's this, where I see them. But then it's like, but they're sponsored by this shoe brand. Yeah, so exactly. That, you know? Yeah. And now with Instagram, you see everybody in every scene. And so it's like, it's really tough. It's like, is somebody underground just because they don't get paid to skate? You know, I don't, yeah. I don't know. But that's always been, you know, the Theories of Atlantis site originally. That was the whole kind of premise aside from me writing articles. It was to like give a, the web store and the the site was focused around independent videos right, like from right. around the world. Yes. You know, and people like Kuba, you know, like carrying his videos and doing articles on that and Japan videos and like, you know, Joe Perrin doing stuff in Florida, you know, like that was underground. Mm-hmm. And then now everything has access and everything. So it's, it's, it's weird. Yeah, but, yeah. I think some people identify underground with the VX1000, kind of. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But it's... Even that is debatable, like, yeah. Yeah. You were just mentioning Instagram and, uh, like, for example, not being on Instagram could be considered being underground. But, totally. but even, like, for example, Wes Kramer isn't on it. Like, I think he has a flip phone and, like, he doesn't give a shit about Instagram and stuff. But uh, but he's definitely not underground. I mean, he's, uh, right, right. like, one of the best-known skaters. He won Skater of the Year, so... But he's not on Instagram, so he's not part of that whole scene, but... Well, I mean, for a while, I think almost the entire East Coast of New- of the U.S. considered itself underground, except for like the few people who got some kind of commercial success and they would move to California. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, but most of the East Coast felt like that, and then I'm sure Europe, you know, Western Europe mostly felt like that. And yeah, Japan definitely felt like that, where it's like people doing really like amazing things, but not getting recognized by the established, you know media yeah. hub of California. Exactly. But like I said, that that fueled, you know, for us, you know, it, it lit a fire under us to try to do our own thing, you know, yeah. and try to so it's kind of like good in some ways, you know, but all right, so then I have one from Steve Durante. Durante? Wow. Yeah. Durante, yeah. 
from uh, Static 3, one of my favorite parts of the whole, yeah, yeah, like the music and everything. So he said, is Static 6 the end of the Static series? And if you were going to do another one, what skaters would you want to work with for parts? (laughs) That's probably the most, the thing you must be asked the most. Yeah, I would say (laughs) the other thing is, uh, is if I was going to ever do a Static 7, I wouldn't say who I was going to have parts for. Oh yeah, no, for sure. (laughs) Yeah, that's part of the fun of it, you know, is like... Keep it a surprise. Yeah, there's some parts in this new one that people didn't expect, and it's like more fun mm-hmm. to see it. You know, the best, the funnest part of it was the New York premiere before, and skaters in the video didn't even know some of the guys, you know, uh, one or two of those mm-hmm. cameos. But, uh, but I, you know, I've said it's three videos in a row. I've said it that, that this is the last yeah. video. Yeah. But this one, it's just, I was uh, uh, six months ago, I was saying it absolutely 100%. There's no way because I didn't think I'd be able to even skate again because of the, my back problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't, I don't plan on it. <laughs> Let's just say that much. I definitely don't plan on there being another static video. I don't know. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I guess uh, you'll have to just wait and see how, how your body uh, evolves in the next few months or years. And uh, if the desire to do another one comes back or not. Uh. This one was really hard for me to finish. It was really, cause there, you know, the more, the longer you go to, the more expectations you feel of it. Sure. And so it gets hard. Even every video has been harder and harder for me to finish because I have of myself at least, but I have these extremely high expectations of it, it has to be different. It has to be, you know, and at a certain point, it's like you're reinventing the wheel over and over and over. Yeah. And, and I just feel like it just sets me up to disappoint people the longer I drag it out with how little, how hard it is for me physically to film and how hard it is to have the time. Cause I just put every waking second of that. I'm not working. I'm thinking of this fucking video and obsessing <laughs> over music and freaking out about, you know, B roll and how the titles are going to work out and you know it's like it's a lot to do with yeah yeah, no no i'm sure all right i have a couple questions from joel meinholz nice so he said hey josh looking back at static one i'm curious about the decision to include me in the video and what you were thinking when you were putting all these different personalities together it turned out to be a massive opportunity that genuinely changed my life and i wanted to express my gratitude for it i feel honored to be part of the static toa family thank you There's this Taco Bell incident in Miami involving Ricky (laughs) Dixon and Steve Brandy during the filming of Static. I think you were filming Forrest and let to get everyone food. My memory's a bit fuzzy on it. Can you share your version of that experience? I'm curious to hear the details. Oh my God. I'm sure the story has been told, probably. But I wasn't actually there. I was filming. We would light up those, there's those old synagogue rails, those cement rails that everybody skated in Miami for years and years and years. Uh-huh. Joel would destroy those things. That, I mean, Joel asking how he got apart. I mean, we would, we started going to Miami. Paul Zitzer and Matt Milligan started going to Miami first from Tampa and they would film, you know, it was like, there was a scene down there of a few guys, but most people, you know, underground, you know, they, they were very little known except for this guy, Tim Von Wern, who ended up writing for Burr oh, and uh, Paul and Matt would go and film each other down there. They filmed Paul Zitzer kick flipped into the triangle like in, oh, yeah. in like 97 or something. It's crazy. Vert skater. And uh, they, I think they're the ones who introduced me to Joel somehow. But Joel, each time I would meet up with him, the few times I, I skated with him, each spot was like a gnarly spot and he would just do everything. Mm. Like, so there's, I have like a few different examples of like the, like the synagogue rails. We get, he'd just do, you know, front board, front lip, front nose slide nose grind nose blunt you know everything <laughs> just banging them out while everybody's trying to just get a feel for this one but uh <laughs> Joel is incredible and he's he's like he's just such a unique energy like he's such a, a rad character and so mm-hmm. and especially now you know he's so he's so he's more enthusiastic about skating and filming than anybody else when we go down to Miami today Joel's like older than me and we go down there and he's the you know where what are you guys doing you're gonna go to sleep it's like you know one in the morning he's like I got one more spot and everybody like the 20 year olds in the back of the van are like dude yeah. can we just go back to the <laughs> yeah, yeah, like yeah. literally wow but that incident, to keep it short, like I was filming at those synagogue rails and they need, some guys were hungry because we were just waiting, you know, they were waiting for somebody to land a trick. So Joel drove them to Taco Bell and some drunk like thug guys were in front of trying to cut in front of a line and they're trying to, and Joel wouldn't let them. Mm-hmm. And at a certain point, you know, they're honking and Steve and, and our friend Ricky Dixon were like, dude, just let these guys in because they look dangerous. You know, they're like <laughs> sketchy dudes. Like, yo, just let these guys in. And Joel's like, fuck that, man. We've been waiting in line. So he kept cutting him off. And then they finally, the biggest guy got out and came around 
and swung and punt like into the window and punched Ricky Dixon in the face. Oh wow! And so Ricky gets hit in the face. Steve's dodging. He's in the passenger seat. This guy's leaning and swinging at Steve. So Ricky gets out and just runs across the street. He goes around to Joel, and Steve said the whole time, Joel's driving, Joel's laughing the whole time. <laughs> okay. And he, the guy comes in, he swings, and Joel just dodges the punches, and then the guy tries to kick in through the window and kicks at Joel's head, and Joel moves, grabs the guy's ankle, and pulls him up. And so the guy gets, like, swept out like a carpet <laughs> up, up, is being pulled out and hits his head on the ground oh. and smashes it. Wow. And Joel basically kicks the guy's ass without without even swinging once, you know. <laughs> and the whole time, wow. Steve said they're like they're terrified. Steve's like seventeen years old, so he's like super, you know, like and he's panicking. He said the whole time Joel's just laughing and just like like having a blast and like while he's still <laughs> steering and just fucks this guy up one handed and then just ended up getting their Taco Bell and wow. leaving. Which is insane, but uh, Incredible. it's just one of the, there's all kinds of Joel stories like that that are just like legendary, but that's, I wish I saw it, but I wasn't there. They just came back from, <laughs> from Taco Bell and Ricky's like, got been punched in the face and Steve's got this story. Incredible. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's do this one. Josh, what are your thoughts on the future of the VX1000? Do you think it can last another 10 years and... Alternatively, what are your th thoughts on an HD camera, be whatever kind, with the MK1 lens with 4-3 ratio? Is that, is that acceptable for you? What, what do you think about that? Obviously, it'd be great to get a VX mic, but um, I don't know. There's, I'm just saying, what, asking what's the, what would be the alternative setup, you'd say, in five years from now. Did you recognize the voice? No, I didn't. That was Will Harmon. Oh, nice. God, I've known Will for Will used to come to Tampa when he lived in when he was in New, North Carolina. So I've he might have been in all the static. Uh... Pretty close. He wasn't in the new one. Okay, I know that. So, but yeah, he's he's been in, in most of them. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, he's he's the best. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I really I think the future is is really difficult unless somebody you know there's like a couple guys that are you know well known for fixing the cameras, but I, I can't see them being interested in doing it for much longer. Yeah, um, I think what he's referencing is probably at first when I saw somebody doing the um, I wish I could remember his name. He's a British uh, filmer at the Vladimir Film Festival. I saw his video where he does the HVX with the the Mark One. VX lens, you know, like attached as an, with an adapter and he films it basically four, three. Mm -hmm. So it's HD, but it's four by three with the VX lens. And at first I was kind of like, oh, but it looked good. I think that's what he was doing. But anyways, that's what Will's proposing. Yeah. At first the idea of like, okay, well, if you're going to film HD, why not film it, you know, 16.9, because that's what most TVs and movie theater screens and everything, that's what right. they're all formatted to. Yeah. But now that I've had more time to think about it, and I do think that's probably going to be the, the best solution with VXs becoming more and more tricky and more and more difficult to work with, you know, because, you know, we do trips like Jake Todd, who films for and works oh, for yeah. the Theories of Atlantis yep. and films a lot of stuff for us. He goes on trips, you know, and it's like, dude, these VXs are so temperamental, you know, and it'll it'll do something like you could ruin a whole trip, you know, by mm. by banking on the fact that one or two VXs are going to hold up. But I think that that combination of the of HD but four by three with the VX lens is going to give it the that's probably the best solution because it's the most reliable. You know, yeah. that's the thing. Those like the HVXs are sturdy ass cameras and they're more reliable. You don't have to worry about a tape case because that's the other thing. The tape mechanism is a big one of the main problems with the VX is. And then at least you're, it's HD. Mm -hmm. So that's probably the best, the next best solution that's going to be the way people carry on. Yeah. But I do agree too. It would have to have a VX mic. It'd have maybe that wooden camera mic or something because that is such a significant part of the VX experience. You know, yeah, yeah, you don't definitely. really notice it. If you're watching VX footage, you don't notice how good the sound is. But then when the second you hear like the HVX mic, it's like night and day. Yeah. You know, so. All right, let's see. Yes, I have another audio one here. What's going on, Josh and Quentin? Uh, I hope you guys are doing well. My question for Josh is, um, what were some of your influences at the time of Static 3 as well as 4 and 5 and how that's led up to the making of 6? Specifically, like, song choices and 16 millimeter to shoot as well as, like, any kind of themes or concepts you wanted to, like, see through. Yeah, to me, Static 4 and 5 
feels like a love letter to New York City with like the music choice as well as like focusing on that specific group of skaters as well as like paying tribute to a lot of the skaters that came before them. Yeah, that's it. Thanks for giving me a chance to talk. Peace. That was a Zach Sales. Oh, who cool. did that video Veil recently? Yeah, yeah. He's one of my favorite new video makers. Yeah, I mean, new, you know, for me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> as for far sure. As, you know, um, and he's been doing that's from what I'm aware of. I think that's his third full length video. But yeah, I might be wrong. I've only watched uh, the Veil one. I haven't checked out his other work, but uh, I really like that Veil video. It was really cool. Yeah, no, he does a great job. His editing's great. His his filming's really fucking good. Yeah, and um, it's crazy because his titles for Veil when it came out, I think Veil came out. I'm guessing end of 2022 maybe beginning of 23 but the in-camera titles that i was doing for static four i mean static six yep. had a similar like ethereal feel to them so when his came out i was like fuck uh-huh. you know like i just saw it on instagram i was like oh fuck dude i hope this doesn't look too similar okay but then i watched you know watched his video and it, it's it has a similar like texture to it but his i think are maybe digital you know i think his are, are uh, after effects okay i'm not sure but i was just kind of like oh no you know like <laughs> so that there's we have a kind of a similar i feel like we have a similar um leaning towards a certain kind of like feeling but sure uh i think what he's kind of getting at maybe with that question is the cities themselves have had a huge influence and maybe because that started because he specifically said static three on yeah and static three it's very influenced by london and new york you yeah know, it's like i went to london to film for static two and just was like i I knew I was going to love London, but it, I was just like, I really wanted to make it a you know part of the art direction. And then getting to move into New York in 2006, too, it was like, that was a heavy driver. So that's kind of always been a big thing for me is, is you see it, if you pay attention to that or if you care, you know, that's significant with Static One when uh, with Washington, D.C. Mm. It was like a major part of the way Washington, D.C. made me feel. It has kind of like a creepiness to it mm-hmm. to me. But um, then it's like a Static Three with London and New York. Static Four, I was like... Like, I live in New York now. All these guys I'm skating with are in New York. Let's make it, you know. And obviously the train theme is like perfect, like solution to kind of like push that vibe. And then the new one, it was uh, Chicago, going to Chicago and just being like, fuck, uh, the city's so rad. And I'd never, I hadn't been to Chicago until mm. like 2016. And uh, New Orleans, you know, it's just like, if, if you pay attention watching it, you can see it's obviously, like he said, it's like a me visually falling. Yeah, know, love letter. Super, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, those cities just kind of basically trying to give people the feeling of what how I felt, you know, mm-hmm. experiencing those cities. Okay, let's see. I think I have another audio one here. Yo, Josh, this is Paul Young. Sick. All right, before my question, I'm going to preface it with a little bit of an anecdotal story. So when I was a kid and I was learning how to edit, I have a musical background, so I'm real rhythmic with the process. Like I set markers and match the skating with the drums and... You know, that whole thing, I used to cut right on the beat, especially when I was younger. And um, maybe seven or eight years ago, I wanted to, like, stray away from that a little bit. I don't know if I got bored with it or just, like, it seemed too predictable at a point. So I was trying to learn how to, like, swing the cuts especially and, like, just give it the edit a little more flavor. And one day I'm sitting down, I watch Static 2, and the DC section comes on, you know, the j Roo song and shit, and it just hits so fucking hard. And I'm watching it, and I'm like, man, what the hell does this guy do? So... Long story short, I, I bring the edit into Final Cut and, like, chop it all up. And I'm looking at the waveform and I'm trying to, like, reverse engineer it. Like, where the drums are, where the skating's landing and, you know, the cuts and whatever. And for the life of me, I just couldn't come up with any kind of, like, a science or a formula. So I guess my question is, you don't strike me as the kind of guy who would just drag and drop shit with no purpose. And, you know, every, your edits are always fucking on point, but they're not rhythmic to my brain, at least. In a traditional sense. So my question is, what's your process without giving away too many trade secrets? Um, You know, when you sit down and it's time to edit something, especially in the beginning when like, you know, it's just the song and you have the skating in a folder like with nothing. So, yeah, I don't know if you could just talk about that. I'd be real interested. Peace. Sick. That's a good question. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, yeah. Excellent question. That's interesting that he would do it that way. I mean, I I always felt like I edited way too much to the beat or to, you know, and that's what's tricky is a lot of times you'll have... I'd edit to the beat and then a skater would come in and we'd start working, you know, going over the part together. Mm-hmm. And they'd be like, but hold on, 
like, can we make it fit to the beat more? And they're like, what are you talking about? It's exactly to the fucking beat. What are you talking about? And then they would be following. There's a different, there's not just a, you know, a bass line, but there's like a, you know, there'd be like a, I don't know, it depends on the song, but there's different things that are repeating, you know, that are in a repeated pattern and people, you know, different people tune into different parts of the song. So that happened to me several times where I was like, what are you talking? Oh my, you're following that as what you're calling the beat. I'm Mm. calling this the beat. But at a certain point, I felt like I edited like Static One is a good example. If I look at it, I'm not embarrassed, but I feel like uh, I went way too heavy on it was Static One was the first video I was able to edit in a non on a non-linear yes. system yeah yeah i remember reading you know about so that, i yeah. could actually have control you know you had to exact control everything and so i spent way too much time doing that mm. so i felt like it's more important to not be super if you're it, it just becomes too like he's saying he, he felt like it kind of became cliche or yeah predictable so i've never done it the way he said you know where he's really dissecting and really re- being super adherent to the beat but I tend to, what I first do is I listen to a song, I think, because I don't have, nothing I do is like a process. I'm just a a bumbling idiot with everything (laughs) and it just, but I will find those significant moments in a song that are the most dramatic and that call for either a slow-mo, something slow motion or some like really strong B-roll, you know, 16 millimeter thing I have that I know I have of that part. And I'll use those as my markers, just Mm. saying, okay, these are, I, I feel like, Not directly, but just in hindsight, when I'm thinking of the editing style, I would imagine I probably was influenced by that with uh, Ty Evans' Transworld videos. He really, you know, used... Basically, I look at a song as a a finite and extremely precious resource. So it pisses me off when I see a good, a really good editing song used in a terrible way in a video. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, most of us consider a song, once it's used, you can't use it again. Yeah. And so Ty's stuff in those Transworld videos, he really, he treated the song with res- with the utmost respect and used those critical moments the way they should be used. So that's how I start is I listen to the song a trillion times. When I used to have a car, when I used to drive, I, I would do it a lot when I'm driving long distances. So I, I wasn't actually thinking, you know, you yeah, just yeah, feel yeah, it. Yeah. And then stuff would come to mind like, oh man, what if, you know, Kenny Reed was in fucking... You you know, Egypt, yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever. So yeah, it's it's more just finding those, like I first find those special moments in the song and try to place stuff there and then I'll build around it so that it's not just a predictable metronome that's going back and forth. Mm. But then like Pontus Alve once, he, when I showed him Aaron's Static 4 part, oh yeah, he was like super critical and he was like, w- w- hold on a second. He's like, I mean, I was, I was, honestly insulted by it but 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 he he was making this point of like how i the way i edited how i you know he's like no he's like prop he was teaching me how proper editing is which i was again i think that's bullshit but pontus is an incredible video yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that's true but but still i mean you you are as well so well i'm not gonna say that but i just think regardless i un you know I would take his advice as being like coming from a, 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 a fellow, very, very talented, yeah. yeah, and a very, felt, very, very talented yeah, like that. Yeah, but yeah. he also thinks, you know, he was thinking his way was the only, was the way. And he was explaining how the skater needs to always start on the left. And if he ends on this, on the right side, the next clip needs to start from the right side. And I was like, Pontus, that's how you edit. That's how you, you know, we all have these different things that we think are standards, you know? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so sometimes I won't like a video when I first see it, you know, and I'll be, I'll be in my mind, I'll be super critical of it. And then I have to watch it a couple more times. And then I kind of start seeing it from that other perspective. Yeah, and I'll really because you're seeing it through it. your eyes as a video maker yourself. And so you're right. analyzing it. Totally, totally. And it's weird because there are videos that I really like that I didn't like at all at first because it, it challenged that the way I thought it should be done. Sure. But those are the, vi- the videos that are different, you know, are always the ones that are the most memorable too, so. That part, that Aaron Harrington part you were mentioning, was when you showed it to Pontus, was it the way it ended up being in the Static 4 video? Yeah. Yeah, it was actually the, that was the part I sent to Pontus, because Pontus asked me about 
he wanted a New York skater on Polar, early stages of him, you know, starting the brand. And I, yeah. I sent him Aaron's part, Aaron's footage edited to that song when I never planned on using that song for, for his part. I just... It was the Wu-Tang uh, cover thing by El Michel, Michel's Affairs? Actually, no, it, that wasn't in there yet. That, that was, it was the second song, the, uh, the group home song that, okay. uh, you know, because his part has that intro, the El Michael's Affair, and then goes in, yeah. Right, right. So there's that wo the group home song that I just thought was kind of like obvious, you know, I was like, oh, this is such an amazing, you know, East Coast 90s hip hop song that it's too predictable to use. But then it just works so well to his skating in New York and like introducing a New York video. I was like, I ended up settling on like, all right, well, fuck it. This, this has to be the song. But yeah, I think the, the one he was commenting on was the, the final edit, though, Okay, because he wanted to see it. But you managed to convince him regardless? You told him, like, no... No, I don't think so. I just told him that I'm... I mean, like, this is this guy is going to be, and, yeah. Yeah, no offense. I don't, you know, yeah, like I said, radio. I Yeah, I'm not going to... I don't give a shit what Pontus said. <laughs> I, I just was kind of surprised, like, that he was so, like, you know... Adamant like, it, about... It was so offensive to him, you know, where it was something I never even thought of. It just shows how we all see things differently. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's see. Uh, so, okay, so I have one from Ryan Clements. He said, of course, I've known Josh before he skated. I got into it maybe two or three years before him. But considering I skated daily with his older brother, Jeb, I got to be around Josh quite a bit. Josh was always unique and intelligent. I specifically remember him being into swords at one point. <laughs> I thought that was cool. Then when I was about 17, so maybe that made Josh 15 or 14, not sure. But anyway, that's when I recall him specifically being into skateboarding. It's hard to remember a lot from back then. We were just going for it. My crew was searching for ramps and venturing far to skate parks, but Josh was in the streets. Once we both were officially in the industry, we went on completely different paths. Mine is more, much more commercial, working with non-endemic brands, etc. After all, I am an agent. That was a foreign concept in skateboarding when we were kids. I'm attempting to set up this question here, haha. Josh has always worked on the cooler side of skateboarding. He's the ultimate example of non-wavering authenticity in every capacity. At what point did he figure out his path? Did it come naturally? What continues to drive his commitment? Because we're talking 30 years here. Jeez. Well, thanks, Ryan. I think maybe, the, uh, again, for the sake of brevity, I would say what he's referring to, I would say I probably realized that after the audio video. I think I did the audio video, had that experience, which was the best experience I think you could possibly have in a, a brand of that capacity or that, that magnitude, you know, because yeah. it was just like run by the best, like Jeff Taylor, Chris Miller, and then like Tony Hawk, you know, being at the, you know, they're all like just... Even though it was a big brand, it was the best dudes you could have running it. They're the most grounded, like, rad people. But that experience made me really want to go back to making another static video. Mm -hmm. It kind of put in perspective of, like, what I felt like I, you know, what I cared about, you know? And it's like, I cared about all the guys on audio. They all became, you know, friends. And some of them, like, are still family to this day. Mm -hmm. But doing a, a project for a brand felt less meaningful to me, you know, like not, not during the time, but in hindsight, no, sure, I went yeah, back yeah. and I was like, oh, I want to do something small again that I'm in control yeah, of. And then exactly. I did static too. And just the experience of that felt more, you know, organic and meaningful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and like I said, no, if that's not a judgment of all, I mean, they don't even exist anymore. So it, like I could insult them all I wanted, but <laughs> I'm not, I'm done, you know, it's like, it's not, there was, that was a rad, the people behind it were fucking rad and yeah, doing things yeah. for the right reasons. But The idea of doing a, uh, something to sell a product, especially something that doesn't have like, um, you know, I don't have an emotional or, or personal connection to. Yeah. It. So, so that, that, I think that was, that was probably where I, I made that or that had an impact on me to make that decision. Because, yeah, it's like I think about it often, you know, of like, man, it would have been cool. You know, I think of like, oh, that would be cool to like do more like bigger brand stuff and make a better living for myself or, you know, but you know, look at these people I, I've gotten to work with and I still am working, you know, yeah. I'm still working with Steve, you know, and Jamal, who are my, two of my best friends. And, you know, it's more, far more meaningful. And you get to propel, you know, people, they probably, you know, like somebody like Jordan, he's going to make a name for himself regardless. Yeah. But to be able to be involved in their story, you know, yeah. and be connected, you know, like somebody like Nate Broussard, like I feel like I was super lucky to be involved in that, that part that I feel like he's probably remembered for. Oh, now. yeah, for sure. Definitely. You know, and who knows where any of these guys' careers would go, but just, it's more meaningful, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs>
No, absolutely. I'm sure, I'm sure all the, I can't speak for all of them, but I'm sure most of the people that have filmed parts with you on static projects are just so stoked to look back on that today. And like Ali Todd, like he, he had a, so, a bunch of great parts, but that one specifically is really, really cool. And uh, Soy Pande as well. Like all these guys had, um, I'm sure they really cherish having, you know, and that's why people like Jordan today are want to get involved when you're coming around and saying like, do you want to be a part of cool. Static 6? Yeah. I'm sure uh, he looks back on that and says, yeah, that's, that's going to be something I'm going to look back on and be stoked on, you know? Well, it's also um, the beauty of it is being able to get if they're as long as they're down, but is in, involve anybody, you know? And so like, like getting day one, you know, we went out of our way, tried to, All right, you know, yeah, to yeah. make sure we got a clip of day one in this video because he's incredible yeah. you know, just in general, but just like, I have always been a fan and, and, but basically, you know, doing an independent thing like this, like Jordan being involved or Trevor Thompson or whatever, you know, anybody in the video, yeah. it's, it's them being involved is one thing, but then they get to be alongside guys that they, typically they might not otherwise yeah. you know so that it's it's like a collective family right that exactly. comes with a, yeah yeah all right this next question is from jeremy elkin so it's two questions he said what is your process for song selection can you describe a few steps and what tips a certain artist or track over the edge I was curious about mm. that because like of course like i'm a big fan of uh, all the music and static so You kind of talked earlier about the early stages of like going to record stores and kind of randomly going through, like looking for the visual appeal or something, like um, triggering something. But uh, how do you deal with that nowadays, especially for this latest one, for example? It's so tough now because everybody, um, everybody's using like Spotify and um, sites like that where our services like that, where everybody's music is getting like pimped around, you know, like mm. if I just like a, a thousand songs over time, because that's the only way I listen to music nowadays, typically is Spotify. So anybody who follow, who's like a, I'm friends with, or they are friends with me, my music gets suggested to them. And likewise, yeah. so I'll have some really like some stuff that I I've, I feel like there's no way most people, you know, a lot, most people know this stuff and then I'll hear it at like, like we're, there's a coffee shop here in St. Petersburg, Florida that my girlfriend and I go to and they're playing music. That I'm just like, how the fuck do they have this song? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like, this is something like it took me, I, I, you know, when I found this, I was just like, there's no way, you know, and it's just, it's just the way music is now because of these algorithms feeding each other. Yeah. Stuff. So it's kind of like right. not fair anymore, but the old process was much different than it is now. I mean, there's no specific like i don't have like a a process yeah, i just yeah, yeah. i listen to music all day at work i just, there's like a several on you know re, uh, internet radio stations i listen to that specifically you know dig into like b-sides of stuff that you, you know stuff oh, that cool. yeah. most people probably haven't heard okay and that's all that's all i'm ever I, like i've said to my girlfriend and other people i'll be in i'll be 95 years old and i'm still going to be like every song i listen to i'm going to be considering it for a skateboard <laughs> yeah. it's just like that's my it's an addiction but it's it's my favorite part of it you know and when you find a song that's kind of like why static six not why i started static six but i the intro song to static six i found that like right after static four came out and i was like the over the rainbow thing yeah and it's just like this has to be yeah, an yeah, intro it's to really a static cool. video this, yeah. i mean it just even if nobody else likes it i just i was i just had to you know it's like i have to make an edit to this yeah and you know for static it's like it's so tough because you want it to be it needs to be something that you hope nobody's ever heard before you yeah. know because the videos that the, had the biggest impact on me when I was younger were, were like memory screen where all the music was stuff you've never heard before. So when you hear it for the first time and you're watching the video, it's like the music and it's like you you only listen to that music yeah. with that in mind. Right, you know? right, so right. Yeah. That's super critical, but it's not always possible, um, especially nowadays. And then obviously static, it's just like I want something to... Um, It's gotten more and more like this as the series has got as aged, but I want it to all be songs that haunt you, mm. you know, like something that even if you're not super stoked on it the first time, like I want you to like it give you a feeling, you know, like mm. some kind of like feeling and leave you with like you start humming the song two days later, you know, yeah. 
I want something that just has that like a grimy, like leaves you with this kind of haunting feeling. And it's, it's not really something you can describe. Yeah, know, but, yeah. 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 But when you, when you find it, it's like, you know, when that song happened, like, like for me, Egyptian lover for Jamal was just, oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. he wasn't like, at first he thought it was too cliche because he was like a, a breakdancing kid as, yeah. um, when he was young. And so he was like, oh, this song's too obvious. I was like, not to me, dude, this is the song. This has to yeah. be the fucking song. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to, you know, and he was like, I don't know. And I was like, <laughs> please, God, let us do it. Yeah, yeah, it worked so well for him. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, it was so good. Yeah, also, uh, Bobby Pulio, he had the, uh, what was the name of the band? Uh, the Kings? The Kings, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you told in another interview, like, he, did he suggest that song to you? Yeah, yeah, that was his idea. And, uh, but you were, you were down for it once you listened to it and you were like, yeah, that could work. And I mean, that song is like, I think in the top, top 20 best skate songs ever. I mean, yeah. I, mean I can say that because I didn't choose it, you know, but I, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I've said before too, I've looked back after the fact and I, I don't think the kinks were ever used yeah. before that. Yeah, yeah I read that. Yeah, yeah, crazy. It's absolutely insane. They're kind of, it seems of like impossible, but yeah. Yeah. But Pulio is one of those, he's, his taste in music is very specific, you know, like he said, he won't listen to anything after like 2001 or something like that. He's <laughs> like, no, no, nothing counts. But his, he's got, he's got some uh, really, you know, interesting eclectic music taste as well. All right. The second question from Jeremy is how important is it to find and document unseen spots in 2024? What goes into preserving their mystery when anyone can post anything? Were there any spots in Static 6 that you found early on that eventually became skated by the masses? <laughs> uh, well, Jeremy, again, you know, maybe a lot of people might know, but Jer Jeremy was a skate video maker. Yeah, and back in the made day. some yeah. amazing skate videos. Uh, And he particularly, you know, was a New York, filming in New York, lots of night footage, you know, his videos were, um, had their own, you know, unique aesthetic and were really, really sick. But, mm -hmm. um, I think maybe he's referencing something specific here, but yeah, it's, it's, it's impossible nowadays, mm -hmm. you know, like it's like the perfect example, which is what I think Jeremy's referencing is Jamal and I were skating up near Madison Square Garden mm -hmm. and we, we skated past this crazy light pole that had fallen down and it was leaning against a fence or a, a bridge down to, it doesn't matter. Anyways, mm -hmm. uh, over a bridge into a train yard. Okay. And he started rigging it up, moving it into position and um, it's in his part, it's in his uh, static six part, but it's like a really sick where you grind, you, could, you ollie on to the rail on sidewalk level it's only like eight inches tall but and then it it goes behind a, a pole and a fence and then goes up into a rainbow shape you know and so it's like this really wild ride that when you film it you don't you know you can film it to where you don't know what's coming and he back grinds it and then you know goes up this thing and comes back down um anyways we i thought he had just found it but it turns out he and jeremy had found it when they were working on a little piece together a few weeks before that but anyways i thought we found it that day We filmed this trick and shot a photo, and I was so fucking stoked on it. Mm -hmm. And I sent a, the photo to Jake Todd to show oh, it yeah. to him. It's like, yo, look at what I got of Jamal today. And I was like, basically saying, I hope to God nobody else finds this, you know, because Jamal made it skatable. We had to pull these rivet, these, these screws out of it and like wax it and whatever. And Jake immediately was like, dude, and he gave, sent me the emoji of the monkey with his face <laughs> in, his, yeah. in his hands. He said, he said, some kid I know posted that on Instagram last week. Oh, and okay. so Jamal and Jeremy found it. They made it, they put it in position, made it skatable. And then within that week or so between then and me filming it with Jamal, some kid finds it, films it on Instagram and puts it on fucking Instagram. Oh. So it's just like in a city like New York, it's absolutely impossible. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's like, but the, the benefit of 2024 is that there's so much media that it kind of doesn't matter. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Unless it's like in a major video and a major skater that everybody's going to see, it's like you kind of can't even worry about it anymore. And that's what's, it's good and bad. You yeah. Because yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. that was such like a big commodity in like our, st our side of skating, you know, was finding, and I'm not crediting myself with that as much as the skaters that I got, that I, that were in static videos. Right. Like right. Ollie Todd is a great example. Pulio is obviously the most famous example yeah. of people really putting, it's, part of their craft was finding stuff and seeing it in a, in their own unique way, you know, skating stuff that other people wouldn't have thought to skate. Right, exactly. And, uh, but now that's the norm, you know, that's been the norm for 10 years and it's crazy because it's like the most mainstream, like big name skaters, you know, on the biggest brands are approaching skating that way now because they saw 
you know, that it's frustrating because it's like they, they wouldn't have naturally skated that way, but they see that that's more interesting than just going to a big set of stairs you oh, know, yeah. and yeah, yeah, switch definitely. heel flipping them. <laughs> so everybody's in the same game now and it's all immediate because of social media. So it's like the battle's kind of lost. Okay, well, let's wrap it up here. But it was uh, an honor and a pleasure, and thank you so much Likewise, for, uh, for t- spending so much time with me. Really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, no worries. No worries. I appreciate it. That's it for my conversation with Josh. Follow him on Instagram at MyStaticLife. Go visit theoriesofatlantis.com to buy some of their merch. Most importantly, a digital or physical copy of Static 6. Do yourself a favor and go watch and rewatch all of Josh's iconic videos such as Cigar City, One Step Beyond, Welcome to MIA, and all the static videos. Thank you for tuning in. See you soon for a new episode of Beyond Boys.